right. Very good. All right, let's see if we can get this done before the thunderstorms roll in and mess with our electricity and internet. Anyway, good evening. Welcome to the Township Committee meeting, June 14th, 2021. This will all be uh, Zoom remote access, normally held at the uh, Municipal Building 770 Coopertown Road in Delanco, New Jersey. Roll call, please. Mr. Brown. Present. Mrs. Patrick. Here. Ms. Holland. Here. Mr. Ouellette. Here. And Mr. Templeton. Uh, here, good evening. Um, also present, Mr. Schwab, our township administrator. We have Mr. Fox, our township engineer from ERI, Mr. Highhold, township solicitor, Mrs. Lohr, municipal clerk, Mrs. Martin, deputy municipal clerk. Uh, Mr. Fenimore is absent, um, Chief Jesse DeSanto. And we also have uh, Aaron Provenzano, our IT information technology specialist, keeping us all connected tonight. Did I miss anyone? Sounds good. Uh, flag salute on this uh, very special flag day. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. For all. <laughs> Sunshine statement, Mrs. Lohr. Please be advised that proper notice of this meeting has been given in compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act in the following manner. Written notice has been mailed to the Burlington County Times and Courier Post and published in the January 5th, 2021 editions. And written notice has been posted on the official boards and board of the Township of Delanco 48 hours, at least 48 hours prior to the meeting. Um, this meeting is being held by a remote Zoom meeting platform and with the meeting ID and passcode posted on the website and the official bulletin board and the front window of the municipal building. Uh, the advanced public comments will be accepted via written letter or electronic mail, and they must be received no later than six hours prior to the commencement of the published public meeting start time. And all advanced public comments must be submitted to the municipal clerk's email or to the attention uh, at 770 Coopertown Road. Um, members of the public who wish to make comments or have questions during the meeting, may either make their comments or questions via audio option or by typing their comment or question via the Zoom platform chat option um, to all participants, not a specific participant, during the public, public comment sessions. And I'll add to this, or it says, or during any scheduled public hearings, which we have several this evening. And lastly, the um, agenda for this remote meeting is available on the Delanco Township website, delancotownship.com under agendas tab. Thank you, Mayor. All right, very good. Uh, before we get rolling here, uh, I just want to make a, a comment. Uh, as we all know, we've been dealing with a very difficult situation with a, a sanitation contractor, as many communities in the region have been uh, having problems and other, uh, other businesses, in fact. So, uh, we've uh, on the agenda have that as a separate discussion item uh, about midway through uh, before the public comment. But I would like to uh, just mention at this time a uh, uh, special thanks uh, to uh, Deputy Mayor Alette, uh, Municipal Clerk uh, Janice Lohr, uh, uh, Deputy Municipal Clerk uh, Kitty Martin, um, uh, Beverly Russell, uh, Aaron Provenzano, Aaron McFadden, and Jessica Husband and administration for dealing with this and trying desperately to keep the community up to date on the best available information. But uh, I just wanted to get that out initially. And uh, as I said, we'll have a, a dedicated discussion on uh, what we know and what uh, we may expect. So uh, first item, uh, ordinance 2021-11, an ordinance by the Township of Delanco and the County of Burlington, state of New Jersey, prohibiting the operation of any class of cannabis business within its geographic boundaries and amending chapter 110 of the Township Code. This is second reading by title only in a public hearing. Um, uh, regarding this, uh, I know that the planning board last week, there was uh, uh, some discussion on this as they had to uh, review the, uh, uh, this item. And uh, there seemed to be a l some misunderstanding of what this actually does. Uh, this does not in 
infringe on uh, personal rights that the new legislation regarding cannabis uh, uh, enables. It is strictly uh, this, uh, this ordinance uh, that we are considering and that many other uh, numerous towns in, across New Jersey have uh, either are considering or have enacted to basically give a little time and space um, as the rest of the framework across the state on how this is implemented across several agencies and departments uh, going forward. So uh, this is merely, uh, uh, this affects zoning and uh, we are have a August, um, what's the date again, Mr. Heinhold? August 20th? Uh, it's August, 20th or 21st, Mayor, somewhere right around there. August 22nd deadline, that if nothing is enacted by default, uh, right, the right. various uh, five uh, classes of uh, um, anywhere from retail to wholesale to cultivation to production uh, and uh, so forth could, um, could appear and uh, by right uh, appear in any, uh, any zone that's uh, deemed appropriate uh, as, as our current learning is. So it's, um, that's all this does. It gives the township or municipality uh, time and space to consider this. So uh, right now it open, open the hearing open to the public on ordinance 2021-11 regarding cannabis. Mayor, if I may, just okay. for the record um, in your packets, township committee received a uh, memo from the um, Blue Guardi, this uh, planning board uh, solicitor, um, basically saying that the board did vote to uh, adopt a resolution that it is found the uh, ordinance consistent with the stated principles and goals of the township's master plan. Thank you. And uh, before uh, I take any questions or comments from the public, uh, let me just uh, give Mr. Heinhold or Mr. Schwab an opportunity to clarify or correct anything I may have stated that might not be entirely clear or correct. Uh, I'll just echo that this is um, really about zoning and only zoning. This has nothing to do with what people in their personal lives and, are doing. This has to do with people who get licensed by the state. You have to go up here. To, that's mute and unmuting. Yeah, Got some background noise. Uh, really those in the public can can mute, please. Uh, we're getting some background interference. Thank you. Um, so the the other thing I will say about this ordinance is that if if we do nothing, we default into certain zoning uses, which is from a planning standpoint, sort of relinquishing control and not a good approach to planning. And secondly, if we enact an ordinance quickly to, to permit certain uses in certain zones, we are locked into that for five years. By passing this ordinance, we um, can always revisit and enact an ordinance in the future to permit certain uses in certain locations. But that should be done once the state regulations are released and we have a better sense of how this is operationally going to work and impact the municipality. I would say that probably north of 80% of the towns in the state of New Jersey are enacting this type of ordinance, which is called the opt-out ordinance. And again, it's just to buy time <laughs> to understand the process better and to take a better long-term planning approach to this issue. That's all I have, Mayor. Um, Mr. Schwab, do you have any comments before uh, take questions or comments from the public? No, I think you've covered it all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. At this time, again, the uh, public hearing is open on uh, Ordinance 2021-11. Any comments, please state your name, address. Thank you. Vera, Vera Darmo, 605 Hickory Street. I'm in support of this ordinance. Um, I want to see what happens with other towns. And I think what we have to offer um, a possible business uh, distribution warehouse. What we have be next to 130. That's not going to change. Even if we even if we take a wait and see approach, we still have that strong point to offer businesses. So I feel comfortable waiting 
um, but still want to, in the future, possibly uh, take advantage of um, businesses coming to Delanco. But at this point, I do support this, this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, yes, sir, with uh, Mr. Sandy, with your hand raised. Uh, my name is Mark Perry. This is my wife's account. Uh, I live at 32 Ships Way, and I'm opposed to this ordinance. I uh, am opposed for several reasons. One, I work for the state of New Jersey in the Division of Taxation and the Excise Tax section where they issue licenses, where they go out and review, uh, do investigations and so on and so forth. And there's lots of agencies. This is a state uh, program that the state would take the lead in the enforcement. And therefore, uh, uh, I myself have issued licenses and so on and so forth and denied them. And uh, I think the state is well uh, experienced in uh, enforcement. Number, number two, uh, I believe that the uh, that the uh, benefits outweigh the drawbacks of this ordinance. I do not know how many lots you business for business, uh, uh, commercial and retail that you have that are vacant and whether you're receiving any taxes from those vacant lots or not. But I do know that the declimatization of cannabis will uh, support that people who are going to use it anyhow will at least be able to buy the product, including medical, in a uh, safe environment and would be able to use it with the restrictions and the guidance of the state. And that would cut back on, on the uh, enforcement. I, I believe that they're not gonna allow people to walk around the streets and go in public parks and all over to smoke uh, cannabis or anything like that. Uh, it, it's, it's the benefit. It gets rid of the underground economy. It will be highly taxed and highly regulated. And if you wait five years, like the ordinance says, uh, if you pass this ordinance, you have to wait five years. And by then, uh, if, if, are you really gonna open it up? I feel that it's discriminatory because uh, where pharmacies can sell opiates, which are drugs, you're telling me you would approve a zoning uh, allowance for a pharmacy business where by definition alcohol or beverages are considered a drug you would would you allow a liquor store to open where cigarettes are very harmful but almost every store sells them they're, those are all licenses. Why is this different than that? Other than it has the stigma that it has as an illicit drug for years. And I'm mostly concerned not about the recreational, but about the medical. Right now, today, I've been told 
by a, doc, a, a, a doctor's office that if you satisfy the uh, requirement for prescription for medical marijuana, we would have to travel to Belmont. That's the closest place today. The medical marijuana uh, issue has been around for 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 a longer longer period of time. Not anybody could go in and say I want to even pick it up. They have to be they have to be certified. They have a picture ID. And right now, today, as the regulations for medical marijuana exist, you cannot get it by delivery. And the township of Delanco must be awful rich if they're willing to give up vacant properties or have no vacant properties in those uh, commercial retail and uh, and industrial or farming, and they must not need any building permits, licenses, and whatnot. They, and I suggest that if you're against the riffraff coming into this township, you contact New Jersey Department of Transportation and have them take the Riverline station away from Delanco because you know, you know as well as I do that, that the drug dealers and other bad elements travel the Riverline like everybody else. My main objection is on page two of the ordinance on the second to the last whereas because this is my concern. It's not the Lanco, because I could go to a neighboring town. It says, whereas officials from two prominent nonprofit organizations that, that have been established for the purpose of advising New Jersey municipalities on legal matters such as have been presented by the act, those organizations and the New Jersey League of, uh, New, New Jersey State League of Municipalities and the New Jersey Institute of Local Government Attorneys. And it goes on. Yes, we, we, and, we have a copy and, of and these organizations. And I thank you for your comment. These organizations, excuse me. You made some very good points. But, but and, these and organizations those. represent all 565 municipalities. So if they're telling the municipalities as an ordinance, this is what we came up with, then they're overriding the will of the people that was just voted on in November. Thank and you. Theoretically, for your comment, theoretically, yes. according I think, to- I think you've made your points uh, well. Staff, Singleton's office. I think they the could override that. And you, you said there was 80%, which I, means I, that it's being voted down effectively. I, I, I as we made the uh, made the point clear at the it, beginning. It also ties you into five years. It's not that's that's that part is not true. And I, I think you've made uh, some interesting points. And uh, I think much of that will uh, take under consideration when those, uh, uh, when the township committee and the planning board uh, considers uh, the crafting of uh, revising the Delanco zoning ordinances, once the uh, uh, regulatory uh, landscape settles down uh, in the next couple of months. So I appreciate your, um, you're well thought out. Say the five years. It says five years somewhere in the order. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin, I think, uh, had his hand up. Yes. Hello. Can Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm going to say that 
I oppose this ordinance as well. And I, I really think it, this decision goes, goes against the will of the residents of Delanco. And, you know, we all have seen the, this number that 73% of Delanco residents voted to uh, legalize recreational cannabis in New Jersey. Uh, there was a public feedback session with this township committee. And I attended that session. As I recall, the majority of, of uh, uh, people who, who voiced their concerns uh, were open to you know one or more of these uh, uh, licenses types being permitted. Um, so I, and, and the end result of this is people in Delanco will be consuming cannabis, um, but they'll just be driving to Edgewater Park or to Riverside. And so their money is gonna be, uh, their, their tax money will be going to those towns instead. So um, I think this decision is, is frankly anti-democratic. Um, and it's a big disappointment to me. Um, just one more quick note. Um, I mean, the, 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 yeah, my, the big, yeah, so yeah, bottom line, taxes in Delanco are already quite high. Uh, I see that the Township Committee is putting through another you know, pretty large bond at this meeting. And th this decision to ban all types of cannabis business doesn't affect the, the high income members, you know, people in Delanco, uh, people who, you know, who, for whom a few, tax dollars here or there don't make a difference. The people it affects are, are lower income people, uh, people who may be, maybe people who would consider moving to Delanco, but, but, uh, but aren't because our taxes are so high. So to me, it just seems like a, a missed opportunity. We could have uh, been a leader on this topic um, and, uh, and reap the benefits in terms, of, uh, in terms of tax revenue. So, so I oppose the ordinance and, uh, and I'm disappointed. Uh, and by the way, I'm uh, Stephen McLaughlin. My address is 740 Rancocos Avenue. Okay. Thank you. Comments. Uh, let's see. I think uh, Mr. Martin had his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before I speak about this ordinance, uh, I think everybody should view the video of the flag salute. That was real neat. It was about a five, three seconds of each person saying part of it. It was cut, cut, cut. I think I saw all of the... Uh, committee people and the professionals and the attorney. It was just very nice to see that. Uh, I miss flag salutes. Thank you. Um, first, I'm a member of the planning board. Uh, I did attend the planning board meeting of earlier this month. Uh, I was the one member that opposed or didn't believe that it was consistent with the master plan. Uh, also, from my understanding and listening to the discussion we had, I don't think there was any confusion on the members of the planning board on what this ordinance would do and how it impacts the master plan. It was found to be consistent. Uh, the reason why I didn't feel it was consistent, there wasn't enough information. Uh, our ordinance is a boilerplate, I'm sad to say, from the minute. New Jersey League of Municipalities. It's exactly what they recommended. Uh, there are six classes of licenses that this ordinance covers. Cultivation, manufacture, wholesale, distributor, retail, and delivery. Those are different uses, different demands on zoning. There was no explanation on how each one of those classes are against the best interest of the health, safety, and welfare of the township. It was just boilerplate. So I could not make a determination that it was consistent because it wasn't any information. Uh, I also have a concern uh, with what is in here. Uh, you're saying that the New Jersey legislature passed a law that we're not happy with because we're locked in for five years. So we'll just deny it and revisit it. I can't think of any ordinance that anybody has ever passed knowing that you're going to revisit it in three months because, oh, we'll have greater information. You're elected to make a decision. I hope you make the, the, the proper one. I just don't have enough information to say this is good for the township. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. And uh, thank you for your dedication and time and effort on the planning board. Um, your contribution is, uh, is valued, but thank, thank you. You make some great points, appreciate it. Uh, I see a gentleman raising his hand, but I don't see a tag uh, with a name or anything there. 
Um, you've got a rather full beard. Mr. Mayor, me? Richard Abdil. Got him. All right, go oh, ahead. Thank sir. you. That's, that's my one defining characteristic. I'm glad that came in use. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I also just wanted to speak briefly. I, I oppose the ordinance. Um, the committee clarified last month lots of the complications that could come with the arrival of cannabis businesses, concerns about water use and electricity and things like that. Um, that makes sense, but that's one, maybe two classes of the, of the five that were at issue. And this is a very broad resolution. It seems uh, like there could have been more granularity in what the township wanted more time to evaluate. Um, that said, I can understand why the timeline has kind of backed townships into a corner regarding making a quick decision now and maybe making a more carefully considered ordinance later. But we we do know that there's a lot of inertia in getting resolutions passed at the, the township level. Um, someone at last month mentioned the, the um, non-conforming fence um, saga that took about nine months. I, I, um, I, so just as someone who believes at least some of the classes of cannabis businesses could be beneficial for the town, I'm curious if the committee could provide any clarification on what, or if there is a plan to provide a more clear timeline for what that evaluation process looks like. Um, if we can't get it done by August, that seems fair. It's, it's complicated and we don't have the resources that other towns might to be able to evaluate this, but is there any plan to form some kind of official effort to evaluate them this information and bring forward in some kind of timely manner. Thanks very much. Uh, great comments. Uh, I love that word, granularity. Um, so it's, uh, um, as of now, we do not have a, a, a grand plan to uh, go through the different categories and see how or where that would fit in. Um, you're absolutely right. That is a very long and detailed process that uh, goes back and forth uh, between the governing body, the township committee here tonight and the planning board and then professionals and so forth. Um, and uh, given, as you say, uh, the, the state law and the timeline has, has really backed uh, uh, New Jersey municipalities uh, up, up against uh, uh, a deadline where not doing anything, uh, you run the risk of defaulting to allow everything. Um, without any consideration of how or where that would go. So um, uh, you, you kind of summarized it rather well there, uh, that we're backed into a corner here. And uh, uh, we tried to, to move this, this, uh, this ordinance along uh, and get it to the planning board and get it back and process it or deal with it tonight uh, and uh, have a little bit of daylight between now and the deadline that if there was some kind of hang up or problem, um, God knows we've had enough of them in the last 18 months, uh, that if something came up that we didn't uh, lose this opportunity. Um, as as uh, we've said several times, this is just a timeout on the zoning issue. Uh, as uh, we get more on the other side of the, the, the deadline, uh, then the five-year opt-out, I mean, any uh, any applicant that comes forward, if uh, Mr. Reinhold or Mr. Schwab, correct me if I'm, if I'm getting out of a limb or getting off in the wrong direction here, but uh, an applicant could come forward and uh, uh, we would have to uh, basically uh, consider that as far as a zoning issue, correct? Uh, but within so, the five-year period. Yeah, the five-year period is if you act affirmatively and zone to permit something, the statute says once you pass that zoning ordinance, you're locked into that zoning for five years. Mm -hmm. What they don't want to see is towns pass an ordinance and say, yes, re our retail uh, centers are open for cannabis and then, um, and then decide they want, I think they want the cannabis business community to understand where it's being permitted and to be able to make decisions based upon that and to rely upon that. So you're locked in for five years if you act affirmatively to grant zoning areas. If you don't affirmatively zone for permitted areas, 
you're not locked into that. So if in uh, a month, somebody knocked on our door and said, we're interested in Delanco, we'd like to have a conversation, we could start that conversation, wrap it into our overall planning and make a determination. If the determination was, yes, this is good for Delanco, then we could pass a zoning ordinance to permit that and they could come in as a permitted use. Um, we're not barred from acting, uh, taking future action affirmatively during that five-year period. Right, as I said, you know, on August 23rd, someone could come in and knock on our door and say, hey, I'd like you to consider my proposal for this, you know, business X, Y, Z, and so forth. So uh, there isn't, you know, a firewall or an embargo for five years. Uh, the door is still open. What we're trying to, what we are avoiding is by default, uh, any of the five uh, permitted classes uh, could come in and settle in any of the zones and, and any location within those zones. So, and that's something that uh, I, I think uh, if, if we did not do this in hindsight, uh, there's probably good potential that we could regret this. Uh, or regret a, a, a sighting or a location that becomes problematic uh, when if we had a little more time to think about it and ramifications and see what the experience uh, was elsewhere, uh, we might be able to place that in a more appropriate location. So um, I think Mr. Martin had a follow-up question. And Mayor, for the record, <clears throat> uh, in the chat function, Mr. Abdel uh, did state his name and address of 525 Buttonwood Street, so that will be entered into the record. Good. Thanks for thanks for following up there. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor Daniel Martin again. Uh, I just want to make sure that as a planning board member in our duties, uh, if anybody came in for a variance, I would vote to deny it because the first issue on variance is, did the town committee in enacting ordinances consider this use in that area? And this ordinance considers that use in that area, whatever it is. How do you, you can't overcome that. We would have to change ordinances to allow anything. It'd be very difficult, I think, to convince a planning, the zoning board of adjustment to allow something. So not to get too deep into the weeds here, Mr. Martin, but I think as a matter of law, this particular use category is treated completely uniquely under the, uh, under the land use, whereas typically somebody is entitled to file for a use variance application. Here, where the municipalities are given the clear opportunity to determine their zoning, um, I think the co correct legal reading is that nobody can even file a use variance application. Okay. But I would work that out with Lou if and when we face that. But I'm looking at it as if we have a business that is interested in our municipality, the proper way is through the ordinance, Agreed. not through a variance. I agree. <clears throat> All right, any other questions or comments from the public regarding ordinance 2021-11 uh, regarding the cannabis, cannabis uh, short name opt-out uh, ordinance? Right, hearing when, Mayor, uh, I do have uh, an email piece of correspondence on, on for this ordinance. Go ahead, thank you. And I do wanna get this on the record. Um, this is from Ellen Bengston. And she um, basically said that she did not want to see any cannabis uses permitted she, uh, in, in the town. And that was an email received from Ellen Bengston. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I was trying to speak up as well. Uh, who's that? Mr. Bartlett. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Matt Bartlett, 1800 Second Street. Um, I am opposed to the ordinance, as I mentioned uh, at a meeting, I guess it was last month. You know, I think it would be perfectly acceptable to use our industrial two zones for classes one to four, but right now with throwing that out the water and just giving the, the blanket ordinance that nothing is welcome in Delanco, 
and you're gonna not gonna see any applicants come forward because they're gonna look to towns that are forward thinking in order, you know, that want the tax revenue. Like uh, Mr. McLaughlin said, you know, they have other towns to go to. Um, February 22nd of this year, marijuana became legal in the state of New Jersey. And here we are just about four months later. And as you said, there is no grand plan right now to revisit it. I don't believe there's a subcommittee formed. There's, there hasn't been any talk. It has been four months. Something has, could have come up with, you know, over these four months that this uh, has been legal in the state of New Jersey. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? All right, hearings now closed to the public. Uh, motion, please, on Ordinance 2021-11. Mr. Mayor, before the motion is, uh, before somebody makes a motion, may I comment? Sure. I'm sorry, I usually first, ask the committee if they have any comments, but uh, thanks yeah. for uh, jumping in there, Mr. Brown. First of all, did a guy eating cereal, that's a Zoom foul, okay? I hope you're done eating because you're on, you're on, uh, everybody's watching. Um, okay. I want to uh, lead off with, um, three, three things about this ordinance, uh, as a township committee member, uh, I'm not real comfortable with the way that this has transpired that tonight you've invited the public to speak and I, and Doug, I know how ordinances work, but basically this is going into the arena four to one. And the folks have spoken tonight, and I just feel like, well, that's, you sort of in, invited them uh, into the arena and they're not gonna be heard, okay? They're heard, but their comments go on record, but you guys have made your decision from the, uh, from the onset of this question. My, um, my theory is, is that this won by referendum, okay? That means something to me, okay? That the, it went on a ballot, people took the time to do it. So it gets shifted to each individual town to you know, circumvent this through zoning. Um, I'm not real, real, real crazy about that, uh, but I, I just have never really been able to say my piece on this. This marijuana referendum is, is small potatoes and we're acting like it's going to change the morality fabric of our town. Drugs have poisoned America and the world. This is minuscule compared to the problems that we see in the future. By being able to legalize marijuana and to put some control on it through good business people, there's nothing wrong with that. So by 80% of the municipalities saying, no, no, we don't want a five-year delay, you're, you're just still putting all that marijuana in the hands of the wrong people, okay? And everything is coming out of Mexico and Mexico is the feline for all the other drugs that come in. Let's take a stand in this little town of Delanco and let's do something about it. Let's welcome it, but let's regulate it, okay? This is actually a good thing. It's like gambling. Everybody was so black, uh, blackballed, you know, no gambling, no booze during prohibition. Haven't you learned by history? This is going to be legal. And I'm going, to, I'm going to finish my thoughts. I think all drugs should be legal. And I think they should be monitored by the government. When I'm on my motorcycle, I'm in intersection and I see 10 heroin needles beside me. That's because they don't have anywhere to go to get these things. Okay. And all the wrong people are making money on marijuana. Let's, let's start the trend going somewhere else. Make it legal. Zone for it. Allow it. And uh, welcome. But don't do the five-year delay thing. You know, you know, it's only going to come our way anyway. That's it. It's a much broader scale, and I think I'm in this position. I'm in one of these chairs that I could possibly help do something about it. And I think Nancy Reagan, when she tried to take the war on drugs, boy, did she get beat. We all got beat. Now, let's get in the battle. Take some of the, uh, the battles back. Maybe it's time. Thank you. Thanks for your comment, uh, John. Uh, any other committee members want to weigh in uh, before we move on? Yes, this is Fern. Uh, in the cannabis uh, regulations and where we need to go with this, I'm in favor in having or exploring where in our town we could possibly do some of these, uh, I guess, uh, 
distribution or uh, through our warehouses. But I think we need to go into it smartly and uh, delaying or opting out for the current period of time uh, and then having control uh, after we get through August and we get into this in a couple of months, uh, things are gonna uh, start getting out there in the media and as towns come on board, uh, but revisit this in you know uh, six months from now and as a committee and getting the uh, Joint Land Use Board and other professionals involved and really make smart decisions on where we would consider doing this in our town. Um, so I, right now I'm in favor of where we sit with the ordinance and uh, feel that uh, it's the right move as far as delaying. And again, if we were locked out for five years, I, my thinking would be different, but being the way this is that uh, opting out and we can hop back in anywhere after uh, August, uh, it puts the control in our hands and not other folks' hands. That's all I have at the moment. Thank this you. Is, this is Christine. And I just wanna say my, um, my vote in favor of this ordinance is not because of my concern about the moral decay or moral fabric of our town. I, I don't personally have a problem with marijuana use, but I do think that we are in a position where we need to make a decision to hit the pause button from an environmental standpoint. We don't, we don't really understand the impact yet. And we live in this beautiful river town, which could become appealing to any of these manufacturers just by virtue of how things could transit up the river. And I'm not willing to sacrifice the pristine nature of this town. For, for a couple quick bucks. Not when we have a warehousing district that's crying for employees and a, a shortage of truck drivers and all these things. Like, I don't think that this particular business is gonna be the savior for the town. So I think hitting pause and waiting to see the impacts on the surrounding town, whoever does wanna welcome them with open arms. I don't, I don't see the detriment because we can opt back in at any time. So that's my question. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick, last comment. Um, I, I am in favor of the ordinance because I believe we do need to actually set up a subcommittee and maybe that can be done tonight so that the public knows that we're not just doing this to totally opt out because um, I, I think we do need to do some more research. Uh, at the meeting uh, the last month when we had the meeting with the people from the public, I guess it was actually, I think it was April 19th. Um, there were a lot of issues as to why we shouldn't, and they were environmental. There was the water supply. Um, there was smell. There were a lot of things that were considered um, at that time. So I think that number one, we need to set up a subcommittee so that the residents that are in favor can see that we are working to do research on this, to contact other communities that are moving forward with it. We have two right in our neighborhood uh, and see where Delanco can fit in to, to allowing one of these or more than one of these classes. I mean, I really think, but, but we need to move forward. We can't just say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna okay this ordinance tonight and then we're not gonna do anything. We need a subcommittee set up right now name some people, volunteer, get somebody from the Joint Land Use Board. If Dan's still on, I'm sure he would probably agree. I would be happy to be on that subcommittee. But that this is what we need to show the public, that we have a subcommittee and we're moving forward to actually uh, research these classes. There's six of them, not five, and uh, come back to the Township Committee with a recommendation as to what we feel would work for Delanco. All right, thank you. And as I had uh, started with uh, a motion, please, on uh, Ordinance 2021-11. So move. Motion by Mr. Allett, second. I'll second it. Second by Ms. Holland. Roll call, please. 
Sorry, I had to unmute. Mr. Brown. No. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Yes, but I would say it's conditioned upon setting up a subcommittee now, tonight. I don't, I don't know if that's a that's yay or nay. So yes, for now, if we're yes. going to set up yes. a subcommittee to look into it. Ms. Holland. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mr. Olet. Yes. And Mr. Templeton. Yes. All right. Ordinance 2021-12, uh, uh, bond ordinance of the Township of Blanco in the County of Burlington, authorizing the construction of improvements in the, of the facilities at the Public Works Garage and improvements to the municipal building and installation replacement of sidewalks along Cooperstown Road and improvements to irrigation systems and repair repaving of the parking lot at the Field of Dreams Park, appropriating the total sum of $721,500 and therefore appropriating $32,325 from the capital improvement fund and $75,000 even from the year 2021 community development block grant program and authorizing, excuse me, the issuance of $614,175 in bonds or notes of the township for financing such appropriations and making certain determinations and covenants and authorizing certain related actions in connection with the foregoing. Um, I've heard there may be some questions from various committee members regarding this. And I uh, want to ask if, uh, we would like to uh, carry this forward to the meeting next week. Uh, so those questions can be answered by various committee members that have, uh, um, have remaining questions. Doug, I, I believe though, you still have to hold a public hearing this evening as advertised, uh, is that? Yeah, so we could hold the public hearing, but if there's questions that need to be answered, we can carry it and then resume for final adoption uh, at the next meeting. Okay. And just as a reminder to the governing body, bond ordinances are one of those unique uh, situations where we need four affirmative uh, votes in order for it to pass. All right, uh, hearing no questions or comments from the uh, governing body, the Township Committee, a uh, second reading by title only and the public hearing. Hearing is now open to the public for Ordinance 2021-12, the Bond Ordinance. As always, Vera, raise your hand, state your name. Vera Darmo, 605 Hickory Street. Um, have we, I haven't seen any um, plans laid out like sidewalks, um, do you, do you have any visuals or maps that you use in these meetings? Uh, we've, uh, we've got a uh, prototype plan that we worked out, uh, that uh, worked out with Mr. Fox and ERI. Uh, there are various segments uh, that have been uh, uh, worked on, uh, various crosswalks or crossings that are required uh, that needs to be worked out, but this is a really uh, getting the money authorized for it to pay for that, uh, pay for detailed engineering uh, for that work. And, okay, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor this, is not, this is not the general plan. This is only the small piece yeah. that is uh, partially funded uh, by uh, CDBG funds, and the, that the sidewalk portion would be replaced with CDBG funds. But we have to upgrade drainage and road work uh, in order to make that work. And the, the vast majority of those funds are for the sidewalk, uh, I'm sorry, the drainage and road work, which the engineers then once this is adopted will be authorized to show do the design. So this is, we put it in the budget. This is the main funding mechanism. Then you authorize the engineers. Then we get the plans and specs. And then you decide if we're going to go through with it. So this is so you step could, two of five. You could authorize the money, but then not, not spend use it. the money, not spend it. Okay, so I have, I have a general question. Why is in this economic climate where, you know, some people might be not feeling it on this board and some people might in this kind of economic climate where the government has to give out money to have to for people to survive, why are these... Uh, renovations and repairs and construction why is this crucial i drove out to the um 
the parking lot at um, it's the Field of Dreams parking lot, correct? That you want to get repaved? Correct. So I drove out there, I looked at it. Um, yeah, there's cracks in there. There's some cracks. And I also went to my Acme and my school parking lot and saw similar cracks that have been there for years. So I'm wondering why is this so crucial now to spend or to authorize to spend so much money in, in a climate where, where uh, you know, we already have tax increases to deal with. And this is just an additional tax increase on everything else. This will lead to a tax increase, correct? The funding for this is already in the budget, which had a minimal increase this year. So, so if this is not approved, then what? You're saying this was like a done deal sort of, or I don't understand. Well, the funding is there. If this is not approved, the money will not be spent. It's been budgeted and therefore if it's not then approved in a future year, then uh, the amount will be canceled uh, for the future years. The issue with that parking lot is that the damage continues to grow as the cracks continue to grow. And if it's not done soon, it will be significantly more costly if we can't repair it, then we may have to replace it. And the goal is to get it sealed up now so that we have it for the long run. This is the most cost-effective manner of that particular project. They all you're, have to do with being cost-effective. So you're just sealing the cracks. You're not like ripping out the whole parking That's lot? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Okay. I did not understand that, that part of it. Then correct. I would support that. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to make a comment, Vera. There are four items, A, B, C, D, that are in this bond. Um, ordinance. So it's not just the field of dreams. There are other areas where we had discussed this at our budget sessions that we are working on. So it's not just item D. There are other it's items. basically just sealing and repairing. Not like it's not like the track, but it's not like the Walnut School track where the um, Board of Ed voted to rip up the whole thing, resurface the whole thing. It's not that kind of yeah repair well, correct yeah, if you like i could go through each project kate i don't know if yeah, that's I think, what people I think want should, because i think she's just focusing on d where right. there's there's four paragraphs that are affected by this right. bond. i did see the municipal garage but i didn't have a chance to drive out there and examine it but now that i know that it's not what i thought that was you know it's not similar to what's going to happen to the walnut street track or what might happen there that sort of allays my fears a lot so because it does sound very cost effective and from what you're telling me it sounds like it's preventing problems that would cost money in the future right. and that's and, only forty five thousand dollars of the total yeah okay i do support what i'm hearing i'm getting more information and it, it sounds good thank you i'm happy to review them all if that's what everybody wants if you could do it briefly there's nothing wrong with more information yeah, I, I would agree with that, Richard, that you should, because I don't know okay. why we didn't vote on it tonight. Sure. Well, just so you know, the public works facilities is $50,000 uh, 50, in debt for repaving the front driveway, including engineering, which is collapsing. Uh, replacing the fuel dispensers is $19,000 in debt, and $200,000 plus is for uh, putting up a pole barn to keep our public works equipment uh, undercover uh, so that it extends their life. The money for the municipal building has to do with some uh, upgrading of the electronic security for doors uh, and working on the meeting room, both acoustics and tech improvements for future live streaming. Uh, sidewalks, the, there's 75,000 for money from the federal money through the county for the sidewalk work on Cooperstown between uh, Pennsylvania and Hickory, that floods constantly. Uh, it, you can't just replace the very dangerous sidewalk there that many of our school children walk on. You have to do then the road and drainage work, which our engineers have estimated 114,000 in debt and 38,000 in engineering. For Field of Dreams improvements, there's the 42,000 in debt for the parking lot repair, including engineering, and there's 96,000 for new well pumping controls. Uh, for the irrigation system 
uh, that is the current irrigation system uh, does not pump enough water to keep all the soccer fields and the uh, uh, softball field uh, effectively watered. We've run into some uh, potential of uh, losing the fields. So we have to increase those things. Those are things that we've been dealing with for at least the last five years, trying to plan for various things. And they're to the point where we could uh, put them in our budget under this debt uh, without having, in fact, we had a decrease in our total budgeted debt service for this year's budget. Uh, we also, I was gonna report during my report, we just sold bond anticipation notes. The low bid was 0.5%. So it's practically, there isn't a heavy interest burden. It was a 0.59 and a 1.25. So interest rates are very, very low for one year bond anticipation notes. And once you accumulate a certain amount, you look and see about going for combining them for longer term debt. But right now that is the way you can borrow money uh, uh, very uh, efficiently. So that's what this ordinance is. We do these every year. We have grouped into these categories. And I've been doing that. Every municipality does that as a way to finance capital improvements in order to maintain your community. If there's any questions, I can certainly answer them. I would just, I'm, I'm finding, um, do you feel that the security upgrades and the acoustic upgrades are crucial at this time for the municipal building? The, uh, the acoustic and, and tech improvements have to do with whether or not when we no longer are meeting by Zoom, whether there's a demand from the community to be able to participate as you're doing now while the governing body members are meeting in person and our room is not capable of doing that. That I is a so. very small part of it. It's about $40,000 of the overall uh, 600 and some thousand dollar uh, bond issue. So it's a very small amount, but that is something that uh, needs to be looked into. So I would be uh, opposed to that $40,000 just because I would hope that we could continue have meetings on Zoom and then that the would be a problem. The law might not allow that. Yeah, the law might not allow that. But okay, that's so the then we'll, let's wait for the law and then we can spend the money. Which will be very shortly. This money, by the way, gets put into capital projects and it stays there till the work is done. Doesn't mean the work's going to be done tomorrow. It generally takes a year to put things together in order to uh, then get out to bids, get the actual bids, determine if they fit the budget and then make the award. So this is long-term planning, it's not daily operation planning. So it could be months or, or a year before any of this is actually spent other than for the planning and the engineering. That's typically how that operates. All right, thank you, thank you for the details there. Thank you for your question, uh, Ms. Darmo. Um, uh, questions? I have a hand raised for Mr. Bartlett. <clears throat> uh, there he is, go ahead, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, uh, thank you, Richard, for reading all that information. I think it's very helpful that the public is aware of you know, what we're voting on here, because just reading the agenda itself, it looks like you know, just a ton of things for a ton of money. Um, yeah. I think it, it was part helpful. of the whole budget package that yep. was online and so on, but it is disjointed. We adopt the budget in one way, and then we come and we do this next, and it's hard to connect those two things, but that's yeah. how it works. I do think it would be helpful when we're when we're talking about these uh, ordinances um, at, at these hearings if they were online so the public could actually see exactly what we're looking at. I know a lot of municipalities put the whole agenda package online. We don't, but I think it would be helpful. But you know the items in there, you know the pole barn. You know I think that's a great idea. I think that's going to extend the life of old John's equipment at the public works facility. So we're not years down the road having to replace a truck or backhoe or whatever else he has out there because it's improperly stored. You know, I, I think that's great. The gas pumps out back, you know, when I bring the ambulances out back, they're antiquated. You know, they're, they're very <laughs> say the least. antiquated Just to say be the nice. Least. You know, I, I, maybe Mr. Fenimore put that there when he first started working for the town 47 <laughs> years ago. That, that's how old they, they pump, are. They pump like this hand pump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I do have a question on the sidewalks, though. Um, I know you mentioned the section over by Hickory Street. Does this sidewalks um, that's included in here include anything in front of the municipal municipal building? No, the funding for that is already from a prior ordinance. This is related to uh, our application to community development block grant funds 
where this year they made that general area eligible for public improvements and over two or three meetings, the governing body uh, had lots of discussion about where that 75,000 ought to be allocated for. And as they prioritized things, they saw that that was the area within that, that geographic area to spend the money on. Because again, if they didn't have a good usage there, then the money would not be available for Delanco. So it was either, so this was the highest priority and uh, uh, it has been a, a problem area for many years before my time and your time. And uh, at some point it needs to be uh, resolved. It's, it's, it's not a safe place for the public to walk. Okay, thank you, Rich. I was just a little confused because it did say Cooperstown Road in here, and I think that section is All right. Sometimes you don't put that kind of detail Mayor, in the ordinance. Uh, itself. Talk about that. Mayor, yeah, and I heard um, talk about the I, difference in the thing. Mrs. Lord. Yes, um, Mr. Uh, to Mr. Bartlett's comment, uh, just so the public knows that all the ordinances that are coming up for public hearing are available on the township website, uh, usually within a day or two after they're introduced. So they're always available. And of course, anyone could certainly email in, call in, and we would certainly send uh, those documents, email them over, mail them out to the public that wish to uh, look at them. And uh, right now we don't have them coming up during this meeting, but someone could certainly, uh, if they have the ability to split their screen, go on and go to the township website and take a look at the ordinances um, so, uh, and if there's a way that we can improve from a Zoom standpoint, these ordinances for public hearing and get, getting them up and available uh, during the meeting, we can certainly do that. But they are available, just not right through this format, but they are certainly on our website and yeah. uh, available to the public. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at, Janice. I have another window up here. I don't see them anywhere on the website. So maybe I'm, well, yeah. <laughs> there's so many different places on here. Maybe they're not just sticking out, but I've looked. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a public hearings tab. Uh, I'll, I'll trust you. I'll keep on looking. I'm not going to hold up the meeting. We'll, we'll sort that out and keep moving. Maybe we'll work on links. You know, we'll we'll put a link in the agenda okay. that'll link to that or something. I think that'd be great. Figure Thank out you. a way to yeah, do we'll that. Yeah, we'll look at Good making now. them more accessible. Sure. Sure, any uh, any other comments on the ordinance uh, dash twelve, the bond ordinance? All right, hearing and seeing none. Any any chat comments, Mrs. Lohr? Not on this ordinance. I I don't see any at this time. All right, very good. Uh, at this time, uh, the hearing is now closed to the public. Uh, motion, please, on ordinance twenty twenty one dash twelve. So moved. Motion, second. Miss Fitzpatrick, second. Second, Mr. Olet. Second by Mr. Olet. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Brown. Let's see, Mr. Brown. Hey, are you muted? Yeah, he is there. Um, he's just muted. John, we're doing a roll call for the ordinance 12. If you could unmute. And we continue. Oh, he, yeah, he's. Continue he's uh, text him. I'll try and text him. All right. Hmm. I wonder if he. No, I'm not muted, so um, he should be able to hear me. Yeah. It is him that's muted, so. Yeah. He, he's, he's not in front of his screen right now, I don't think. I'm going to text him. There he is. Meaning. Yep. John? Can you hear us? Yes. Hi, John. We're doing a roll call for ordinance 2021-12. Well, it took long enough, didn't it? Huh? <laughs> took long enough. Okay. Did somebody motion? Yes. Yes, I did. And a second by Mr. Olette and the mayor called for a roll call. So, Mr. Brown. Yes, on the uh, ordinance. That's a yes. Thank you. Ms. Thanks. Fitzpatrick. Yes. Ms. Holland. Yes. Mr. Olette. Yes. And Mr. Templeton. Yes, thank you. And for, and for the record, it was mentioned earlier to continue this to the uh, meeting on the 21st, but the committee did act in the affirmative and adopted the or ordinance this evening. So it would not, um, it is uh, adopted and will not be on the um, June 21st agenda. All right, very good, well done. And thank you, Mr. Schwab uh, for your soliloquy there. 
Ordinance 2021-13, ordinance to amend an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the Council of Atlanta providing for and determining the rate of compensation of officers and employees. This is the second reading by title only public hearing. Uh, hearing open is now open to the public on ordinance 2021-13. As always, state your name and address and comments on the uh, on this ordinance. Any comments in chat, Mrs. Laura? Not on this ordinance, 2021-13, no. Okay. Uh, hearing and seeing no comments or hands raised. Uh, hearing is now closed to the public. A motion, please, on ordinance-13. Uh, so moved. Motion by Ms. Fitzpatrick. Second, please. Second. And Mr. Olette, a roll call, please. Mr. Brown. Yes. Ms. Fitzpatrick? Yes. Ms. Holland? Yes. Mr. Olette? Yes. And Mr. Templeton? Yes. Uh, we have a special presentation. This is from the Burlington County Joint Insurance Fund. Um, this is Mr. Paul Forlenza is the executive director of this fine group. Um, and every uh, three years, I believe, we have to do a renewal and uh, uh, yes, sir. the uh, uh, the administrators or the directors of the fund. Uh, it's our township's insurance company, basically. Um, home, fire, health, and life, all that, all that good stuff. Uh, not health. But, no, not uh, health. Pers uh, PNC. <laughs> um, so I, I, I had the privilege, I was the fund commissioner, which is the township's representative to the joint insurance fund. And being someone whose only experience with insurance was paying my quarterly bill uh, up until uh, whenever I started doing that about 10, 12 years ago. But anyway, uh, it's a it's uh, a standing group. I learned a hell of a lot. Uh, Aaron Provenzano in the township, uh, one of the other hats that she wears is the current fund commissioner. She's been doing that for the last two years. And uh, she actually was uh, keeping me uh, straight for many years prior to that. Uh, uh, but the DIF uh, runs a great program, uh, uh, heavy emphasis on safety. Uh, uh, claims reduction, training for employees, and so forth. So uh, I might have taken some of the air out of your presentation, Paul, but uh, let it rip. <laughs> it, it sells itself, Mayor. Uh, it's nice to see you. It's been a while. And, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Forlenza. I'm the executive director of the Burlington County Municipal Joint Insurance Fund. And as the mayor indicated, your current three-year membership with the fund uh, is up at the end of this year. As part of our renewal process, whenever a member is up, for uh, up for consideration of, of their membership of the fund, uh, I'd like to come out and meet with the governing body. Uh, you folks are decision makers in the community. I wanna make sure that you understand what the GIF's all about, um, that it's not just simply buying insurance, you are entering into an interlocal service agreement, uh, by far the most successful interlocal service agreement in the state of New Jersey's history. Conservatively, the GIF movement across the state of New Jersey since the mid 1980s has saved taxpayers in excess of $3 billion. So uh, it really is uh, the, the, the primo example, if you will. Uh, I did prepare a presentation. Uh, it was emailed out to you ahead of time. Um, I believe, Aaron, you have it? Yes, Paul, I am ready when you're ready. Uh, if you want me to bring up the first. That'd be great. Know. You can get started, absolutely. Okay. I'll bring it up, or I can do it, Aaron, if it's easier. Um, I think I'm right here. If, uh, is this, this is the first one you want me to pull up? Oh, yes, that'd be great. <clears throat> And you can actually jump to slide two if you want to put it in presentation mode. We'll do. Okay. You're going to have to bear right. with me. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Uh, let me roll through this. I'll, I'll try not to go too long. I know how exciting insurance can be for people. So let's <laughs> try to make this as painless as possible. Uh, as the slide indicates, we are in our 30th year of uh, operation in the, uh, the Burlington GIF. We're up to 28 members. And the GIF is very successful. Uh, and I'll, I'll provide you with some details on that in a few minutes. But our core principles from the very beginning are, are, sit, are uh, stated there. Member-driven decisions. The, the members of the Joint Insurance Fund, the 28 towns within Burlington County are the owners of that program, not me. I work for an outside uh, entity that you folks contract with to run your operation on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, coverage, which is, uh, which is um, really what the towns need. Uh, we recognize you have some very unique exposures uh, in municipal operations, and we provide you with coverage that applies to those types of exposures. 
valuable programs, risk management and safety programs are key for us. Uh, for every dollar we don't spend on claims, it's money returned back to our members in the form of surplus distributions. And I'll uh, demonstrate our, our financial stability and strength. Um, we are very, very healthy from a, from a financial standpoint. And that's a good thing because I never want to be in a position where I am either via Zoom call or, or standing in front of you in council chambers having to talk to you about needing additional money because we didn't put enough money in, in our budget. So Aaron, if you want to jump to the next slide. <clears throat> one of the ways that we track how we're doing financially overall, there's several indicators and one of which is our loss funding budget. Uh, the loss funding is the lion's share of our, of our GIF budget. We use this money to pay for the lion's share of our day-to-day -day claims. Right now, the GIF is self-insuring the first $300,000 of a worker's compensation claim, which is a, an injury to one of your employees, as well as the first $300,000 of a general liability, which would be a, like a trip and fall on a, on a municipally owned sidewalk, as well as an auto liability claim where one of your vehicles would be involved in an at-fault accident with a resident. And then we're also self-insuring the first $100,000 of a first party property loss. That may be being a lightning strike to, to your municipal building or something like that. And you can see that the actuary who's required to certify our uh, budget to the state of New Jersey on an annual basis has recommended that we reduce that lion's share of our budget. And he's not doing it because he feels that um, you know, we need to pinch every penny. He's doing it because the history of the fund, the membership's um, application of safety and risk management programs is paying off. And you can see what our loss funding trend has looked like over the last four years. Uh, again, because he's saying we can lower our, our, our overall um, loss funding budget in, the, uh, in, in when we are also seeing increasing exposures, increasing costs of, of different repairs and things, um, I think this is a testament to, to the good behavior of our members in, in applying those programs. Aaron, if you want to jump to the next one. Another indicator is loss ratio. How much money are we spending of the money that you contribute to us versus the money that you contribute to us on an annual basis? And again, this is just that piece of your loss funding budget, again, that we pay their claim, the, the blind share of our claims. And we look at a six-year rolling average because it's really not fair to look at 2017 as a standalone year or is it fair to look at 2015 as a standalone year? What we look is that six-year bad average. And you can see that you guys are up over 249%. Um, that means basically that for every dollar that you've contributed to pay claims within the fund, we've paid out $2.50 on your behalf. Um, and with a smaller town, that's not unusual, to be quite honest with you, because you do get variations year to year. What we're going to look for is a smoothing over time of that loss ratio. And it's a balancing act, quite honestly. It's a balancing act of get, make, putting enough money in the budget to pay your claims as well as um, uh, making sure that you apply the safety and risk management so you hit that even keel. In an ideal world, this would be 100% across the board. It means that for every dollar you contribute, we pay out a dollar on your behalf, easy peasy. Doesn't work that way, um, unfortunately. So what we do again is we look for that six-year trend and right now you guys are running a fever, um, but over the course of the next couple of years, we're gonna continue to work with you to get that number back, back in check. And again, through management of claims through management of risk, using the safety programs, and quite honestly, elevating your assessment slightly over time. Because it just might be that your assessment hasn't caught up with your exposures. You wanna jump to the next one there? Uh, loss funding, this again is your assessment. And you can see that your, assess your loss funding portion of your budget has gone up uh, over the last three years, about, about 11%. And quite honestly, that's a recognition by the finance committee, again, made up of uh, fund commissioners within the, the membership that are looking at your overall results, comparing them to other members within the program and saying, you know what, let's edge up Delanco's assessment a little bit in the form of loss funding uh, because we think that maybe they're not being charged enough to really pay for their overall exposures. And that's what you're seeing here, a slight trend uh, of an increase over that three-year period. When you look at it compounded, it's about three and a half percent compounded out of that time period. I can tell you that if you were in the commercial insurance market, you'd be looking for a new, pro new insurance provider. But that's not what the GIF is about. We're about recognizing what your exposures are and charging you the right dollar amount for what your exposures are while practicing good safety and risk management. Aaron, you wanna jump to the next one? <clears throat> if you take a look at your overall assessment, again, it has increased uh, over that time period. And it's really due to two things. It's the loss funding uh, increase, which I showed you on the prior slide, 
but it's also a recognition that the uh, insurance market overall across the world has gotten very difficult over the last couple of years in reaction to a number of items, which I'll touch upon in a few minutes. Aaron, you wanna jump? What's nice about the fact that you have seen that increase is that you can offset it with your dividends. Um, if you look down at the bottom here, uh, you'll see that uh, Delanco's history, you guys have been a long member of the fund. Um, you've received uh, in excess of $466,000 of surplus returned back to you over your time with the fund. Uh, that includes uh, uh, in excess of $22,800 last year. I can tell you that we're looking at our budgets now for 2022. We're looking at our surplus position across the board, which I'll highlight for you in a minute. And we are giving serious consideration to releasing uh, an equal amount of money uh, that we did last year. Uh, again, almost 900,000 was released in 2020. Uh, and again, since inception, we're over 10.6 million has been returned back to our members. So we're doing, we're doing well. Aaron? This is our bottom line. This is a snapshot of our financials valued as of 331 of this year. Uh, and you can see, Aaron, if you can maybe, go, well, maybe I can make my screen smaller here. So we can roll down to the bottom a little bit. And maybe make it oh, like 90%. Um, yeah, that's okay. Maybe make it 90%. Yes. Is this? No, other way. Sorry about that. That's okay. I, I see what you're saying. One more. One more. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, you can see as of 331, I won't go through the nitty gritty, but uh, you can see that our cash position is in excess of $15.6 million. So we're doing well from a cash position. Uh, that cash position includes that uh, $10.4 million of surplus that's been returned. Uh, it's a slightly different because we don't incorporate money that's been returned from the EGIF into our financials. Uh, and you can see that overall, even with that response return of surplus of almost $10.5 million, uh, we are, have a current surplus position in excess of 9.5 million. So we're doing very well financially. Uh, but we certainly recognize that there are some threats to that. Aaron, if you want to jump to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, over the last 18 months or so, we've recognized uh, a number of issues out there that are having an impact on our operations. Uh, first one, obviously, is COVID-19. Uh, and I'll get into some of the nitty gritty on some of these. Recreational marijuana, which you just had a, a very good uh, open discussion about, because a lot of our communities are having that same discussion right now. There's been a couple of statutory changes over the last 18 months that have had an impact on our operations. Uh, a recent directive from the state pension board uh, dealing with pension, what we call pension offsets. Uh, the hardening insurance market, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago. Uh, the impact of social inflation on our bottom line and then growing cyber threats. So let me dig into these a little bit deeper. Uh, Aaron, if you could. All right, let's start with, uh, start with COVID-19. Uh, obviously, <laughs> it's having an impact on everybody. Um, the Borough Code GIF is providing workers' compensation insurance for hundreds of first responders and volunteers, including fire, EMS, and police uh, in regards to COVID-19. And there's a statute in place uh, that basically says that if a first responder um, contracts COVID, it is presumed to be that it was done at work, that it was contracted at work, unless we can prove that he contracted it at home or some other uh, place. So we are insuring for that, um, for that. And obviously we're trying to mitigate the risk associated with it through a number of safety directives and bulletins that have been issued over the last year or so, uh, as well as directions that are coming from the fund solicitor, David DeWeese. Uh, what's nice, honestly, if, if you're thinking, and it's kind of maybe it's a bad term to use when it comes to COVID, but um, as of the end of April, the broker GIF had about 850 COVID claims across our 28 members, but our total incurred costs are about $325,000. So honestly, we, we missed that bullet, and I'm very happy to report that. Um, again, knock on, knock on wood. Um, if you compare our numbers to some of the GIFs up in North Jersey, um, they've had some significant, some significant losses. Uh, if you look at the MEL organization, which we are a part of, we are one of 18 joint insurance funds that are part of the MEL organization. The MEL stands for the Municipal Excess Liability Joint Insurance Fund, and uh, the MEL um, self-insures about 550 public entities across the state of New Jersey. And uh, across the state, in the MEL organization, they've got more than $20 million of incurred losses. Um, they've had um, thousands of COVID claims, and unfortunately, they've had nine deaths. So uh, we have been lucky from that standpoint. 
uh, that we haven't really seen the large uh, losses that some of our, our fellow JIS up on North Jersey have, but again, it's something uh, to, to take into consideration. And what's really nice about uh, the way the MEL and the GIF organizations work together, the lion's share of that $20 million, which I just described, is going to be picked up by the excess insurers for the workers' compensation line. So uh, that's a nice breath of fresh air for us because we don't really have to worry too significantly about the financial strain on the broker of GIF. Aaron, if you would. What we've also recognized is that um, it's also had an impact on the way, you do, the way you do business. Obviously, a lot of you are still working from home. I am still working from home three days out of five. Um, we're still practicing a lot of the same COVID standards in regards to social distancing and the like. Um, all of the GIF meetings, uh, I think, have really uh, happened the way our members have. We've moved in virtual format. All, everything we've done has moved into the virtual format. Training, these renewal memberships. I did all of my renewal memberships last year, renewal uh, updates last year via a Zoom or WebEx or whatever the case may be, all the training that we've done for managers and supervisors uh, and uh, our uh, police, as well as our elected officials, everything was done virtually. So we really have moved to that format. And I quite honestly, from a personal standpoint, can't wait to move back. Uh, I look forward to seeing people without black boxes around their faces. Marin, if you would. The next item, recreational marijuana. Uh, again, there are still a lot of unanswered questions in regards to how member, how municipalities are dealing with this issue overall. Uh, there are considerations for impact on employee matters um, from an employment practices standpoint. Uh, there are potential source of land use claims. I heard you talk a lot last, this, uh, earlier about your land use ordinance, about your master plan, and how all of this kind of comes together if you do want to have uh, uh, cannabis operations within your community. Uh, and then Police liability claims as well is a big concern for us. Um, again, lacking a lot of strong direction from the Attorney General's office, we are seeing the potential for police claims. I can tell you that I speak with, or I work with, I think is a better way of putting it, almost 110 municipalities across South Jersey, and the enforcement is going across the entire spectrum. I've got uh, police departments that have indicated that no matter what, they're going to continue to enforce uh, marijuana laws, because it, in their mind, it continues to be a federal issue. And I've got police departments who have indicated to me that a chief has said to me, I can have a guy who can light a joint, light up a joint on city hall steps, and I'm not going to do a thing. So that in inequality of enforcement is a real concern, and it leads to generation of claims. Aaron, if you would. Some of the statutory surplus, uh, statutory changes I spoke about earlier, sexual abuse and molestation, I think everyone's aware that the legislature amended approximately two years ago, uh, the sexual abuse and molestation statutes, which uh, basically did away with the two-year statute of limitations that had been in place. And what it has done is it allowed individuals who may have been victims of this type of situation in prior years, going back eight, 10, 12, 15 years, to bring a claim now against a public entity uh, for seeking compensation for this. Um, that's obviously put a considerable potential strain on the GIF. Um, if, can you imagine where we are budgeting for our, our standard claims or standard, standard activities or standard exposures and risk profiles and, and the like, and then somebody from 10 years ago comes forward and says, hey, the employee in X town is responsible for sexual abuse against me, and he wants to be compensated? Obviously, it can be very difficult to budget for. Again, we are managing these as they're coming in. Luckily, again, I, I knock on wood we have not seen a huge flow of claims against public entities uh, for this. Firefighters cancer presumption. Again, the legislature amended um, the workers' compensation statute to uh, allow that firefighters who meet certain standards, including seven years of em employment, whether you're a volunteer or a full-time or part-time firefighter, they're each, each age of 75 years, and they develop one of 417 different types of cancer that are identified by the, uh, the Institute of Health, National Institute of Health, uh, those cancers can now be considered work, uh, compensable under the workers' compensation statute. My biggest concern, quite honestly, is that you have individuals who meet the criteria under the statute who five or six years ago were diagnosed with cancer, um, went through, had treatment, hopefully successful treatment. Um, their health care provider paid for all the expenses associated with it. And now the health care provider comes after the GIF seeking compensate, seek reimbursement of the health care costs associated with that because it is now deemed as a workers' compensation claim. So obviously that is a consideration for us. And we are seeing now 
um, over the last several months, an uptick in these claims. Aaron, if you would, please. Uh, the pension offset. This was a kind of a surprise that hit us about two months ago. There was a uh, investigation done by the state comptroller's office, as they as they do <laughs> regularly often, and uh, the state comptroller's office made a determination that workers' compensation in, uh, insurers that provide coverage for public employees in the state of New Jersey, and obviously the GIF organizations that are largest insurer of public employees in the state have indicated that um, through the use of what's called medical monitoring, um, they have now shifted costs, they believe, from the GIF, excuse me, from the insurers off to the pension system. Real quick, the way this works, if you have an employee who's injured and injured to the point of severity that they are going to seek an accidental disability pension from the state of New Jersey, well, normally under that type of situation, that worker would have filed what's called a claim petition where they're seeking uh, compensation for their pain and suffering. Uh, prior to this directive, what the GIF would do, and all other, quite honestly, workers' compensation insurers would do, is they would settle that claim petition for what's called medical monitoring, which basically says if that employee needs additional medical care over the course of their lifetime, it's still deemed to be a workers' compensation claim, and they can come back to their insurer for, um, for continuing care. What this says is that we now must settle that claim petition and we can't do it for medical monitoring anymore before they get their pension. So if you have somebody who's severely injured, they could be seeking hundreds of thousands of dollars of compensation from the GIF or their insurer and before they can go into the pension system. So this has increased our costs exponentially. Uh, we're anticipating about 11% increase in our work comp costs across the board as a result of this change. Aaron, if you would. The hardening insurance market, I spoke about briefly. Uh, I think everyone's aware excess property is very difficult right now um, due to increases in costs of um, supplies. I think everyone's aware of the increase we've seen in costs of concrete, timber, and the like, and building materials. Uh, climate change uh, is, is obviously hitting us. We're seeing more storms. We're seeing uh, worse flooding. We're seeing a lot of forest fires across the country and across the world. All of these are having pressure on the excess property market. We purchase your excess property coverage from the worldwide insurance market. Cyber coverage, everyone knows what's going on with cyber right now. I think everyone's aware of the Colonial Pipeline and what occurred there. Well, municipalities are considered low-hanging fruit. A lot of times they don't have the resources to protect themselves from cyber crime. Um, so as a result, we are seeing more and more pressure on this. Uh, we are running out of insurers, quite honestly. Um, there are few insurers that are providing cyber liability coverage, and there are very few that are providing it to public entities. So obviously that's a challenge for us as well. And liability coverage. I think everyone's seen um, all, the, um, all the news reports and, and the social media uh, outlaw, um, discussions in regards to police shootings and judicial decisions that have occurred. And so uh, law enforcement liability, it can be a very difficult line of coverage uh, to manage. Aaron, if you would. Social inflation, this is not spoken about very often, but has a direct impact on the costs of our claims. Uh, and it's really just a bit general be feeling uh, amongst your, your populace, and your populace makes up your jur jury pools, that um, somebody's been injured and somebody needs to pay for that injury. It doesn't matter whether you're liable or not, but somebody needs to pay for that. And that impact is called, um, called social inflation. So it's a general feeling that people should be compensated when they're injured. Uh, and again, we're seeing it across the board. We're seeing increasing litigation. Uh, people are suing for things that maybe 10 years ago they wouldn't have. We are seeing an expanding definition of liability, especially in, in New Jersey, which has a more uh, liberal inter interpretation of certain statutes within their court system. Um, and again, larger compensation and jury awards. So that's a real issue for us that we're dealing with. Could you please move on? Thank you. Uh, and then cybercrime, as I touched upon just a few minutes ago, huge issue for us. Um, you know, we have a strong cyber uh, risk management program in place that includes um, strong technical standards, uh, cyber hygiene training for all of your employees, model policies and procedures. We're doing vulnerability testing on your IP facing networks, with, whether you know it or not, we're doing it on a daily basis. Um, we do have a very uh, strong uh, breach recovery program in place. So if you ever have a breach, you can pick up the phone and call somebody and talk to an expert who's going to walk you through that process of recovery from that breach. 
the Trico, excuse me, the Trico, <laughs> the Broco GIF um, also has hired a technology services director. That's Lou Romero. He works directly with your municipality as well as your IT providers um, and professionals to um, help safeguard you against cyber attacks. He does a lot of different trainings on our behalf. He's doing webinars uh, and he's really been very helpful uh, in a number of cases. He's one of these people too that when you when you call because you have a cyber breach, Lou's going to call you back almost immediately and help manage that process with your breach coaches. Aaron, if you would please. Just some re quick reminders. Um, the Employment Practices Liability Program, you should be in the process of updating your model policies and procedures. Uh, the, the due date for this has been extended to November 1st in recognition of the pandemic. Um, so you're not only are you updating policies and procedures, but you're also going, your managers and supervisors have gone through a series of webinar uh, trainings. Uh, your police command staff are in the process of going through training now. Uh, so please make sure that you, um, make sure that you, you uh, update all your policies and procedures by that November 1st deadline. Aaron, if you would, please. Just some updates on what's new. Um, telemedicine, COVID kind of made this uh, really kind of necessary, but we are now full-blown into telemedicine. Um, it is making uh, getting appointments much easier, but obviously if, you're, if you have an injured employee who needs to see a physician, we'll make arrangements uh, to get that done. Uh, MS Li MSI Live and MSI Now were, uh, were announced as COVID started. It allows you with access to uh, over 130 titles of safety and risk management streaming videos. Uh, we also have online webinars now available for you as well. And then the Joint Cash Management Investment Program. And I thought it was interesting that Rich made a comment earlier during the discussion on the bond ordinance that you just um, uh, did a bond anticipation note with about a half a percent interest rate, which is a phenomenal uh, rate. Uh, the Joint Cash Management Investment Program has been out for about a year now. And just a quick explanation about this. There was a recognition um, across the state that the joint insurance funds are holding on to about $400 million of cash at any given time. And that cash is kind of sitting in bank accounts and investments and really wasn't maybe being used to its greatest extent or possibilities. So they, the uh, legislature amended um, a number of statutes which allowed joint insurance funds across the state to commingle all their funds together into one, uh, one account and then purchase, <clears throat> excuse me, purchase municipal debt, which is something we couldn't do before. What it's done is it's flooded the municipal debt market with cash. And because the GIFs are nonprofits, um, what we've allowed, what it's allowed us to do is drive down the interest rates associated with that short-term debt. And um, it's done a couple of things at the, at the end of the day. First off, it's made borrowing less expensive for municipalities. Secondly, it's increased the, um, it's increased the investment returns for the GIF investments, which again, Money we don't spend gets returned to our members plus interest. So it's kind of a nice way of taking that, that money and, and utilizing it effectively. Aaron, if you would, please. So I, in conclusion, I think uh, the GIF continues to meet our long-term goals. I'm hopeful that you will uh, look favorably upon your renewal with the GIF. Uh, the uh, resolution and agreement were emailed out to your municipal clerk about a week or so ago, maybe two weeks or so now. And hopefully you'll put that on one of your uh, upcoming agendas. Uh, Aaron, there is one other presentation. If you could, if you just click on the report card there, I see at the top of your screen. There it is. Just jump to the second page, if you would, or the second. There you go. This is just your, this is your report card. We provide this to you on an annual basis. And uh, the time your renewal, it's nice for me to be able to come out and kind of go over it with you real quick. On the left-hand side here, you'll see a snapshot of our financials, how we're doing overall, where we're spending our money. Um, you can see that we're running this operation uh, on about 11, 12%. Uh, you compare that to a traditional insurer and they're in the neighborhood of 35 to 40%. So we're running a very efficient operation on your behalf. Uh, you'll, again, you'll, if you look further down, you'll see some of the things that we're talking about in regards to cyber, some of the bigger concerns that we have, as well as the excess market. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, these are various programs that the Lanco Township is enrolled in as a result of your membership in the GIF. This includes your optional safety budget, um, your safety incentive program, your EPL and PLL cyber risk management programs, as well as your wellness incentive. Again, these are monies that the GIF sets aside on your behalf to utilize to support these programs. Again, safety initiatives, risk management initiatives, and wellness initiatives, because we recognize that 
the health of your employees has a direct impact on your workers' compensation uh, budget. Uh, down below that, you'll see a number of metrics that the GIF uses to gauge how Delanco is doing versus the GIF overall. And again, beyond your, your uh, loss ratio, you're doing well in the other areas. So continue to, you know, we're gonna continue to monitor those metrics and uh, continue to push you to, to utilize them. Uh, and then on the right-hand side there, you'll see your meeting attendance, your assessment increases over time and the like. And of course your elected officials uh, seminar. Thank you for attending. Uh, the elected official seminars uh, virtually this past year, your attendance at those does have a direct impact on your assessment. And I look forward to seeing all of you this coming fall, hopefully face-to-face -face at our upcoming elected official seminars. So Mayor, with that, I hope I didn't go too long, but I did wanna take this opportunity. It's once every three years, you gotta put up with me and, and this is it, it's over, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Are there any, any questions? Anybody on the committee? Uh or administration have any questions, uh, Mr. Forlenza? Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff out of the GIF. Like I said, I I, I learned a hell of a lot, and uh, some great people, uh, both uh, within uh, Mr. Forlenza's uh, company uh, organization and all our counterparts in other towns. Uh, uh, that was one of the. Uh, a great benefit uh, sitting at the table there at the at the monthly meetings and be able to lean over and tap somebody on the shoulder and say, "Hey, you know, we got we got this going on in town. Uh, what do you what did you do about it? You know, and uh, uh, does lead to camaraderie. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, and uh, a lot of good contacts and some great you know people, uh, neighbors, uh, neighboring towns far and wide. Uh, someone always you can reach out and and. Uh, tap and then say, hey, what's what's going on? Or, you know, I got a question about this. How are you handling it? So uh, anyway, it's a great, great organization. And uh, I think uh, uh, Mrs. Parabondano is uh, it's uh, going to do well there. So anyway, thank you. So. Thank you all. I wish you a good meeting. Take care. It's nice seeing you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. All right, uh, discussion item, as I said, a uh, uh, special discussion item on the status of solid waste collection delays. Um, uh, I'm gonna let uh, Mrs. Moore and Mr. Uh, uh, Olette talk about this because they, uh, I was out of town for several days this past week, uh, kept in touch uh, via emails and phone calls, but uh, uh, Mrs. Laura and Mr. Olette were the boots on the ground and uh, uh, trying to, Get a handle on this, and uh, uh, Mr. Schwab likewise was uh, was out of state uh, on uh, personal business and so forth. But uh, just to, to start out, uh, Delanco and uh, is is one of three of our three towns in a joint contract with uh, uh, South Jersey Sanitation, now uh, called uh, Seaside Waste, um, and this contract, uh, uh, Edgewater Park is the lead agency on it. Uh, as I said, Beverly and Ed Delanco are partner, uh, partners in this contract. Um, and uh, that was, uh, this current contract was initiated uh, this time last year uh, with what was then South Jersey Sanitation. So um, I'm gonna let uh, Mrs. Lord get us up to date and uh, Fern, if jump in as you uh, see fit uh, in your communications on what we've learned um, over the last two weeks or so. Uh, did you want to go first? I can. Uh, did you have any communication with them today, Janice? No. Uh, no, we're waiting to see um, tomorrow if uh, I believe Beverly's pickup is tomorrow to see if they're going to have any delays. And based on what they experience tomorrow, we'll put into action, um, you know, the requisite um, move, action we have to take based on Beverly's collection tomorrow. I did uh, communicate with Mr. Stage last week. Uh, I also sent him an invite to our tonight's uh, township committee meeting with the uh, with the Zoom connection. So if you want to uh, jump in on this, uh, I haven't seen his name on uh, on any of the screens or his phone number, but. Uh, I think we had a chain reaction of things going on. Uh, the trash company, uh, one taking over, uh, I guess they've only 
been, uh, Seaside's only been our trash company now for about a month. Uh, so you have that going on. Then uh, the shortage of uh, drivers that they and many other uh, trash haulers are experiencing. And then if I looked at where we were over the last two weeks, uh, we had Memorial Day, which would have pushed our trash day from Thursday to Friday, which would have been our normal day. But then they didn't show up and then they said they'd be here on Saturday. Uh, and I guess with the uh, holiday weekend, uh, they didn't have enough employees to be able to send trucks out. So as we went through the following week uh, with them getting folks out here, I believe I saw them on Tuesday where they actually started hauling, uh, picking up trash. Uh, and when I caught up with the guys uh, around lunchtime, uh, they were headed to the landfill to empty their trucks. And I asked them what time they'd be in, back in town. And they said they'd work till about seven o'clock, hoping to finish up the town that night. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, they said they'd be back on Wednesday morning. Uh, they must have had pressure from other communities because they didn't show up here, ended up, I believe, in Beverly and Edgewater Park to start doing theirs. Uh, and after having a conversation with Mr. Sage, uh, he assured that Thursday, this past Thursday, was going to be uh, a whole town pickup. Uh, so just our normal routine. Uh, to my knowledge, they had three trucks in here on that Thursday to uh, get everything picked up. They had a truck breakdown uh, that set them back and they still didn't get the, the entire town picked up. Uh, then they ended up coming in on Friday. Uh, Friday morning, they finished picking up uh, the town. It's my understanding that uh, they still had missed some trash and we'll get into that in a moment. But uh, around 1130 that morning on Friday morning uh, in my driving around and, and Mayor Templeton, uh, I came across South Jersey uh, Sanitation Seaside. Uh, one of the supervisors was running around our town, checking up and following up on uh, their people. So I give them credit for doing that. Uh, but here we are, we're into the new week. Uh, I'm hoping in, uh, that we're back on track on Thursday. Uh, as Mrs. Lohr has said that uh, tomorrow is gonna be, uh, I guess with Beverly being picked up in Edgewater Park on Wednesday, Mrs. Lohr, to your knowledge? Yeah, um, it's either Beverly, Edgewater Park, then Delanco, or it's Edgewater Park, Beverly, Delanco, but Delanco is always the, the third town on the Thursday. So what happens with the other towns on Tuesday and Wednesday kind of sets the tone for us for Thursday. Um, while we, uh, you know, Deputy Mayor Olette, and also Bev Russell, shout out to Bev Russell. We're actually the boots on the ground in the town, looking, going to street to street, making maps and charts and lists of who didn't get picked up, who, you know, who didn't, you know, what still needed to be done. That was, get. they were sending those over to the uh, solid waste company on a regular basis. Um, I was back in the office talking with the company several times a day um, from everything to, you know, where are they at, what were their plan, were, what their plans were, and also trying to ascertain the reason for their, um, you know, delayed performance, delayed service. Um, they're experiencing what all, many of the other industries are experiencing, the lack of the shortage of class B um, CDL drivers, uh, shortage of laborers, usually this time of year, they um, do have lose laborers to other summer type jobs. And she, but she said they usually have many applications ready to go, temp services ready to go. There just aren't those applications and there are not temps available. They did have some recruits ready to go to start work the past Monday and they had one show up. Um, they are uh, also um, experiencing um, some equipment problems and um, you know, they uh, are doing what they can, um, not to our satisfaction, but doing what they can to um, get the trash picked up. Uh, but once you get backed up in one or two towns, it just throws the whole schedule off, just like with recycling is experiencing. 
um, that's already on a week plus delay for recycling pickup. So, you know, there are um, things beyond the town's control, beyond this company's control, but we are working with them to um, make sure that they're doing everything possible to get these trucks in town. Um, the Township Committee, um, you know, will be discussing contractual um, items in executive. The Township Committee will be doing that. Um, but as far as service level, uh, you know, are we going to have more delays? I know a lot of people and kudos to the office staff for fielding hundreds of calls a day. And that's no exaggeration. Explaining, understanding, and working diligently uh, to try to get this uh, trash collection on back, back on uh, track. Um, many things beyond our office's control, um, but they have been spending a lot of time. I know some people are very upset uh, with the delay and they want to know, well, what's our new schedule? What's, and this is a big point. What's our new schedule? What's our new day? What's, and that we don't know sometimes until that Thursday morning when we get that email or phone call saying, uh, no trucks in Delanco today, nobody showed up for work. You know, all the call, you know, call outs. Um, a lot of times when you're pushing the limited crew that you have, uh, you know, 14 or more hours a day in extreme heat, throwing tons of trash a day, they call out the next day, um, you know, or they lose people to other jobs. That's a big thing that's happening too. Not only not being able to recruit, but also losing existing workers to other um, entities that are offering a lot less laborious um, jobs and sign-on bonuses and higher hourly rate. It is very difficult right now. Um, the other issue that people were having were, were part, what we call partial pickups. I'd where, like to jump in there on yeah. the partial pickups. Uh, we're at fault on some of these partial pickups. Uh, trash cans aren't supposed to weigh more than 50 pounds. That's right. uh, on Saturday, I went with the trailer to, because of this one residence, and it took me two trash cans to throw, get their stuff into there, and both those trash cans are still over 50 pounds. Uh, we have to take into consideration as a community, you know, we want these services, but uh, we have to do our part. And looking at the ordinance, and I didn't know this, but uh, a trash can's not supposed to be full more than three, it's supposed to be three inches below the, the top of the trash can, uh, which surprised me because when I put my trash in, you know, I just throw the bags in there and I don't worry about yeah. three inches of, you know, whether it's gonna come over the top or not. Uh, but the, the weight of the trash cans, these guys have, these guys or ladies have to be able to pick these trash cans up and dump them in into the tr uh, back of the truck. We don't have, I guess, what you call a single stream where the, uh, they have a mechanical uh, piece that lifts these trash cans and to empty the trash cans. Uh, so we have to be considerate of that. And the other thing is that coming across, and we've been very uh, generous as a community. Uh, because we all have clean outs, you know, we're cleaning up our yards. We're, uh, we probably take more trash than, or allow more trash to go out to, to the street than uh, probably most communities because we want to keep our town clean. But when we have these houses that are being cleaned out totally, you know, I think we as a uh, community need to take a look at that. Do we want to allow that or do we want to, you know, should that person be getting a, uh, a dumpster or being able to get rid of that trash uh, some other means other than putting it on the on the curb and expecting the trash people to take all of that you know once they throw all that trash into you know they clean up uh, all this trash that's been put out for a house clean out that loads up the uh, the truck then they have to go back up to the dump which delays things uh, and I don't think that's what our trash, uh, was designed for. You know, we want to get rid of the, the food waste and anything that may be a, a health issue. Uh, the clean outs to me are a, a different issue. Uh, there's another house that I saw that had, uh, I guess, 100 plus feet of uh, fencing 
that they cut up and put it out on the street to have that picked up. I think that should have been handled somewhere, some other way, you know, uh, either a dumpster or they get a truck and they take it up to the dump, up to the landfill. I've done that in the past where, you know, I've had, because of the docks out front of the house, you know, we cut up some docks, threw it in the trailer, took it up to the dump. You know, yes, I have to pay a tipping fee or whatever, but it's minimal. It's not something that uh, we should expect our normal trash people to take care of. So I, I think those two issues, uh, the, the clean outs and the bulk kip, uh, items that are put out on the street are a concern. And again, this weight limit of, you know, it shouldn't be more than 50 pounds in the trash can for these folks to have to uh, pick up. And so trash can was left behind. It was more than 50 pounds. I don't blame them for leaving it, uh, leaving it behind. Yeah, and, and uh, that is also supported in our code. Our code does limit the weight uh, to your bundles to the trash cans to 50 pounds. And I believe that goes right in line with OSHA standards um, for a single, single uh, person lift. Um, so there are standards in our code and OSHA standards that they have to follow. So if something is overweighted, um, then it, they, they may not take it. Um, interestingly, I was doing some of the, running some of the math per our contract. It's, um, they're, they charge the township $6 per unit per month. And then when you prorate that over a 12 month period or a 52 week period, it comes out to a dollar, approximately $1.38 per stop um, at each week when they stop at your house to take your trash, it's $1.38. And um, I thought that was very interesting when I ran those numbers. Um, I think the, depending on how this week goes, I don't, I don't see the personnel uh, shortage uh, getting fixed. And I think we're gonna be looking at uh, uh, spotty, spotty pickups. Uh, um, I was looking at some other uh, uh, neighboring uh, township websites, uh, Pemberton's having difficulties, Collingswood's having difficulties. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, as, as, Deputy Mayor Arlette has said, we need to uh, kind of work together as a community and uh, bulk items. Uh, if, if you're doing a clean out, I, that's, that's really on you. You need to get the dumpster or if you've got a large, uh, you know, you're taking down the, some, you know, demoing a room or demoing a, a fence. Um, I think to be fair to the community, you need to arrange your own disposal uh, mechanism for that. Uh, if we're only gonna get one truck or two trucks for a day or part of a day, then the space getting consumed by your sofa or the demoed portion of a room that goes in there, and that means that uh, a couple streets don't get picked up, um, that's, that creates a problem for, for all of us and, 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 and your neighbors. And so I think uh, uh, whether we want to take some action tonight to prohibit, uh, um, you know, bulk, uh, uh, bulk trash going out as, a, as, as one of the things that uh, we can do. Uh, we've, uh, Mrs. Lohr and Mr. Lett, uh, uh, and I believe uh, uh, Mrs. Russell have, have surveyed other companies uh, other tr trash sanitation companies, and they're tapped out. Uh, they are not taking on uh, additional customers. It's not like we can, you know, say, you know, goodbye Seaside uh, South Jersey Sanitation and jump to uh, somebody BFI or waste management. Uh, uh, it's uh, we're, we're we're in a difficult spot here. So it really is incumbent until we get through this, however long this lasts, that. Uh, uh, reduce the, the, the bulk disposal, hang on to that stuff if you don't need to get it out. Uh, if there's you know, stuff that's garbage or perishable, diapers, things that need to get out and, and get properly disposed of, that's the priority. Those are the priority things that need to be, get out to when those trucks are here. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's, it, I don't know how, how big uh, our teeth are as far as, uh, directing that or enforcing that, or whether uh, it's just trying to get the word out to your neighbors and say, hey, you know, or um, the other thing is securing the trash. If uh, we're expecting, as, as Mrs. Lohr said, uh, 
And Mr. Uh, Alette said, uh, hey, we're expecting them on a, on a Wednesday and they don't show up and people put their cans out on a Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. Um, please, please, please secure the trash. Keep it, you know, get a lid on it. Um, uh, don't, you know, loose paper bags, uh, cans without tops on it. Uh, this, this has the potential to really create problems with uh, vermin, um, with thunderstorms rolling across the river right now. You know, we can't have uh, 600 trash cans getting blown over down the street um, with unsecured lids and so forth. So uh, this is going to take, uh, uh, you know, be a little uh, attentive to this and, you know, watch the skies. And uh, uh, as uh, Mrs. Lohr said, we, we've, uh, the office is desperately trying to keep up with the, the changes and accurate information. And we're putting as much pressure as we can on the, uh, on the contractor. So uh, anyone have anything to add to that or suggestions or a course of action? Mike, uh, I think uh, when we changed uh, haulers, well, we didn't change haulers, the hauler uh, sold. Um, I, I think we should have expected some problems and uh, I, I hope we can all be patient. Uh, I do think that anytime you pick up a new collection route, or delivery route, it's very confusing. I, I know from having a Philadelphia Inquirer morning motor route, and it was 50 miles a day. And uh, at first it was the most difficult thing I've ever done, but I got pretty good at it after a while. And, you know, every night I just whip right through it. But uh, I, I, you know, based on what I've heard from Janice's conversations and Fern's email, of which by the way, they did a very good job. Uh, I, I really think this company is just growing pains within our town. Uh, as far as the bulk pickup, though, are we, if, if, if we enforce or change policy on bulk, which I, I'm covering, uh, do they, do we all have to do the same thing together? Because the last con one of the contracts I sat in on, we had conflicting town to town, um, you know, feelings about grass clippings and uh, bulk. So, um, are we hurt being with the other two towns or is it beneficial? Well, I, I believe Over. that um, Doug should answer this. Uh, my understanding in the, uh, when you look at the, the, the agreement documents, while we bid as a consortium for bidding purposes, we uh, as a municipality can act individually in, what, in the action that we take. Right. The, the terminology in the contract goes back to individual members. So if there is a determination or need to take action, we are not bound by the group. Individual members can take action. And, uh, in the meantime, do we just want to uh, try to get some word out to uh, highly encourage okay. uh, our residents not to put any bulk items, see how this week goes. And if uh, uh, we have a week uh, coming up like last week and the week before, then uh, maybe we can uh, uh, put something in black and white next Monday. Well, I think you definitely should. And I think the issue with the, the trash cans and the lids, uh, we were addressing that a couple of years ago because a lot of people just put trash and stack it on top over and over. It's a wonder, it's no wonder it falls over because they aren't using receptacles that can hold the amount of trash that they have. And I think we should start enforcing that issue. And then maybe if people would buy sufficient trash receptacles, that would also be a help uh, because it, I, I don't know, I went through this town myself to see what was being picked up and what wasn't. And um, it, it was amazing how people just put their trash out any old way. It's, it's a tough job and uh, you can't blame them for not going to work some days. When you, when you take a look just right around this town on trash day, it's just absolutely amazing how people put their trash out. Well, let's, uh, let's see how the week goes. And uh, uh, Janice and Fern and uh, the whole uh, administrative staff, thank you, thank you, thank you for the good work and keeping up and uh, we'll see how the week goes. And if we need to, uh, uh, to take, have a firmer hand on this, uh, and we'll um, talk about that next Monday night. So, Mayor, um, just uh, for 
the Township Committee under Chapter 245-18, I was doing a little research in the code, uh, does allow the, um, it says to ensure the effective operation of the provisions of this chapter, which is solid waste and recycling, the Township Committee is authorized to make from time to time such written rules, regulations, or orders as may be necessary to or expedite to further implement the provisions of this chapter. So Doug, I, I would interpret that, that they can do a resolution, do a motion to whatever without a, a, the, a needing a full ordinance. Is that, would that be correct? Uh, no, I'd wanna look at that a little bit closer, Janice, because I think it has to be consistent with the uh, <laughs> existing provisions of the ordinance. So it depends on what, it depends on what we're trying to achieve. Okay, all right. And the, if I, the only other comment I would make on it, even though I would tend to agree with exactly what the mayor said about reducing the trash in order to be more efficient in collection, we pay, the amount that we pay the vendor includes the bulk collection. If we voluntarily say they don't need to pick that up, that doesn't change what we pay them. We pay them the same amount. Uh, so that's, and then if we put that on the resident or have public works do it and so on, that's additional cost. I'm not suggesting that might not be the way to go at this point in time. For example, if, if we could switch tomorrow to mechanical collection, even at a significant increase, I think we'd be incumbent to do that because the long term of having trash collection with the guys in the back, as opposed to the mechanical uh, one arm bandit collection, Willingboro just went to that. I think Riverside did. Uh, Del Rand's had that. We didn't get any bids this time for that. The last time we asked for that, the price was double, and we weren't willing to pay that double, as was one of our neighbors as part of this, as uh, John Brown was pointing out. Uh, but I think that's the future. And if we could make that sooner rather than later, even at a larger cost, I think that's something you need to seriously consider for the long run. Yeah. All right. All right. Janice, well, uh, Mayor, Mayor. Mayor. Another thing. Janice, do you hear anything as far as recycling for this week? We do not, we do not have a recycling uh, date as of, as of t today. Thank you. Um, it, it, I would say it appears that we will not have recycling this week. We uh, did get that letter from the freeholder director. They're already scheduled out to Wednesday. Our, our collection day is Thursday and we're not on the schedule. So and they're way behind, way, way behind. Which means so, a lot of recycling is in the regular trash, which yeah. makes that even fills up the trucks even faster, which means more trips to the dump yeah. and less time on the route. Mayor, may I ask a question, um, uh, Doug? We have a really big storm rolling in. I see a lot of lightning out my window. If we were to lose this transmission of this meeting, it just gets cut off. Three uh, times. Internet, electricity. What would be, Doug, what would be the protocol? Uh, we've never had this before, just in case we lose this meeting. So unfortunately, I think if we lose the meeting, I mean, we could try to reestablish connection, but if we can't do so within a reasonable period of time, 15 or 20 minutes, um, then I think the meeting has to be concluded and we will have to either reschedule or just pick up the rest of the business at the next agenda. May I ask the um, mayor and township committee that maybe we do the consent agenda and at least get the official business, the resolutions. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, we have things that need have deadlines and need to be done tonight. Okay, great, great idea. Yeah, sounds good, uh, excellent idea, given uh, all the colors on the radar. Yeah. All right, we'll jump to the consent agenda items. Consent agenda items are considered to be routine and will be enacted with a single motion. Any item requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All consent agenda items will be reflected in full in the minutes. Are there any items on the consent that uh, any committee member would like to be uh, have any questions on or pulled out for separate consideration? Hearing no objections or uh, request, uh, resolution 2021-71, release performance guarantee for Cornerstone at the Lanka, Lot 2100, Lot 3.05 with conditions. Resolution 20, uh, resolution-72, specifying the salaries of certain employees within the Delanco Township. 
resolution 73 providing for the insertion of any special item of revenue in the budget of any county or municipality pursuant to NJ, NJS 40A colon 4 87 chapter 159 public law 1985. Is there a letter missing there? NJSA? Yeah. Well, uh, it, it, sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. So it's okay. New Jersey statutes or New Jersey yeah. statutes annotated. Okay. Annotated just yeah. means it has the cases and history along with it. Thank right. you. Resolution 74, authorizing removal of one handicapped parking space at 416 Ash Street. Resolution 75, refunding unexpired escrow account. Resolution 76, authorizing participation in the FY 2022 Governor's Council on Alcoholism, Drug Abuse, Municipal Alliance Program and authorizing the mayor and township clerk to execute the form 1B for the submission of a strategic plan for said Riverside slash Delanco Municipal Alliance grant. Resolution 77, authorizing grant application to the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs for certain athletic and recreation facility improvement, facilities improvements and authorizing the mayor and clerk to execute said application. Resolution 78, re refund of overpayment, parentheses, dog license. Resolution 79, uh, award a bid and contract for road improvement program contingent upon, upon uh, NJDOT approvals. Resolution 80, authorizing execution of agreement with Stanker and Galetto. Payment of bills, uh, current fund, $1,037,708.835. Payroll, $192,142.63. Capital fund, $4,551 even. Uh, dog fund, uh, $1,100 even. Escrow trust, $23,613.50. Housing trust, $128.50. Municipal open space, $8,639.71. Approval of business license, 2021-40. Approval of department reports. Approval of consent agenda. Motion, please. So move. Second. Uh, roll call. Okay, who was the second? I'm sorry. Jay Brown. Thank you, John. Okay, Mr. Brown. Yes. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Yes. Ms. Holland. Yes. Mr. Olette. Yes. Mr. Templeton. Yes. All right. We're official. Great idea, Mrs. Laura. I would actually, to continue with the statutory requirements, maybe open the meeting to the public because of um, meeting does require at least one session open to the public, not including the public hearings for the ordinances. Great right, public comment statement. Purpose of the public comment sessions is to allow residents to share information and reviews with the Delanco Township Committee. Since the committee may be hearing the information for the first time, it is not always possible to have issues and questions settled within the public comment session. Um, the report of advanced remote meeting comments slash questions. This section is to acknowledge and read those comments and questions received by the municipal clerk in advance of the remote meeting, either by via electronic email or written letter as required by NJAC. 5 colon 39-1 at Sequeter. Uh, members of the public participating live in this meeting will be given the opportunity for comments and questions during the meeting, one or both of the public comment sessions. The meeting is now open to the public for comments and questions, session one. Please state your name and uh, your address. Mr. Mayor. Who said that? Uh, this is Marilyn Entman, 101 Bellevue Lane. I'm under the name of John Todd in disguise. So um, tonight I'd like to publicly trash talk. So I want to um, first thank the township committee and all the employees for what they've done concerning this trash issue. I follow a lot of towns, Haddonfield, Collingswood, Pensalkin. They're all um, experiencing the same uh, problem with the trash pickup. But I just want people to be aware there is no away in throw away. Um, but we as residents have to join in and help resolving this problem. It's a long, long um, issue and it won't be resolved quickly and we need to participate as residents to help resolve it. Um, as Fern said, when I walk around town, I see before this trash issue, I see an excessive amount of trash cans sitting out in front of homes, trash overflowing all over in the curb and in the street. When we get heavy rains, that all washes down and ends up in our river. 
And that's what we see is a lot of the things that have overflowed out of people's trash cans. Then you see some homes where residents are only short term there and they choose to throw away all their possessions and they put it out any day during the week and you put, pass old sofas all beat up and all kinds of things on the uh, street. I know in Collingswood years ago, they chose to give residents that wanted them compost containers. And it was an opportunity to sort through your trash and appropriately compost what um, wouldn't end up in a plastic bag in the um, landfill and not be able to break down. But I think we as consumers need to reduce our consumption of waste product. You know, you look at all the water bottles and all the things that are in the trash in the recycle can, and you wonder if that's really necessary. You know, and I'd like to see some sort of educational program involving the students and um, maybe the scouts involved and the women's club and some things, but it's time for us as residents to make some major changes. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent ideas. Um, and uh, we'll pass that along and you're certainly welcome to contact the uh, uh, the leaders of those various groups and uh, see if uh, all or any one of them want to uh, join in, in in a public information uh, effort. So uh, let's see, I think uh, hand raise from uh, Elisa Trimble. Yes, hi, uh, this is uh, Lisa Trimble, uh, 430 Perkins Lane. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, please. All right, I just have a quick question. Um, last year, uh, I just want to know what the protocol is uh, for township easements. Uh, we have one right next to our house on Perkins Lane uh, between us and the retention pond. Last year in August, and my husband has called twice about this issue, um, where there's a bunch of debris that was blown over from trees and uh, branches and things like that from the township side over to our our side and a pile of just dead uh, branches and everything that came down from that storm last August. What protocol do we need to follow to ask that to be cleaned up? Uh, it is a fire hazard. We've had kids like um, mess around in between us and the retention pond setting fireworks and, su and such. So uh, we are actually in, in right now gonna have three trees taken down on our side but I'd like to see if this rest of this uh, easement can be cleaned up as well. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. I think that's uh, that strip of land uh, is is municipal property uh, up there, uh, and it extends all the way up to West Avenue and and on through. Uh, and I believe uh, that's uh, on Public Works and Mr. Fenimore's. Uh, uh, long, too long due list. So we'll uh, get our heads together and see what we can do to uh, uh, take care of that. But that's, uh, you made the right, the, the, the first step in the protocol is talk to us, yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, let's see, I think um, Mr. Bartlett again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just want to give a report on behalf of DISA. As of about uh, one hour ago, we finished our spring softball, baseball, and t-ball season. Uh, exciting news. Um, our 8U softball team this evening are the league championship with their final game at uh, Burlington Township, where they won 12-3. to Wow under uh, head coach Larry Abell, assistant coach Tom Balchak, and assistant coach Dave Kenny. So a uh, big shout out to our 8U softball team. Our 10U softball team, uh, they were also in the league championships this evening, having made it through all the um, other tournaments uh, at the end of the season. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't fare as well, but they fought uh, for a 3-4 uh, loss this evening, um, but we're extremely proud of those girls as well. They did an excellent job all season long uh, under head coach Kristen Arnold, assistant coach Mark Arnold, 
and uh, assistant coach Julia Morano. Uh, they were at Florence uh, this evening and they just got done right about an hour ago as the storm was rolling in. Um, our soccer season, we have the signups uh, for fall soccer. They're online at dicesports.org. Uh, you can sign up through July 18th, and we're also going to do a few open houses uh, to do signups over the next uh, month or so. And there was an email, email blast sent out to all the parents who signed up on our system. And if uh, I could, I'd like to email the flyer out to whoever handles the uh, flyer, the uh, email distribution from the township uh, system to get out to our residents as well. And I'll get that uh, over in the morning. And that, that said, we, we're happy that we finished our safe and COVID-free spring season. Great, very good. Uh, any other comments from the public? I'd like to keep this moving as there's another line of weather coming in and see if we can get this done before the, if and when the power drops. Any other qu comments, please? I Dan have a, I have something I need to ask. Uh, this is Catherine Tersich Keeley at 740 Rancocas Avenue. Uh, please make it quick. Thank you. Sure. Um, the county replaced our sidewalks on Rancocas Avenue as part of the trail that goes over to Pennington Park, but they didn't replace the curbs and the curbs are in fine popping tire uh, alignment right now. Is that something that I would just pay for? Or is that, do you, do you have any insight into what the county's plan is for that? Did they just replace the sidewalks and not the curbs? The curb should be part of the project. Uh... I'm sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, th that is not part of the project that, that the yeah. county um, has for the, green, the Greenway Trail. They're only replacing the sidewalk and certain handicap ramps. Yeah. So was the sidewalk in that condition, uh, has the condition changed as a result of the county work? Has the, have the curbs changed since they did their work? Is that your question? Yes. Um, nope, they've been in a bad state to begin with. So, I mean, I'm, I'm fine to pay somebody to replace them. I just didn't want to do that if somebody was going to come through and do that on their own. <laughs> well, uh, as Mr. Fox said, the curb, uh, just the sidewalk was part of this, uh, uh, the county project and the curbing will have to be part of some kind of street repair project. It's uh, not on the list right now or not on the immediate list. So I should or should not hire somebody to do this. I'm, I'm just not familiar with what the process is. Okay. You, you certainly can hire someone to, to replace that curb, you know, if, if that's what you choose. Um, I can tell you the county is not going to replace it. And that particular road is not on our road program for at least a couple of years at this point. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your call in. Uh, Mr. Martin. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Going back to the trash. Uh, the triggering event is they didn't pick it up. All these other things, if they picked up our trash on Thursdays, right. wouldn't have been brought up. Uh, is there a liquidated damages that we'll get back in fees according to the contract? Could there are several provisions in the contract uh, that uh, relate to that and uh, allow uh, us or our neighboring communities to exercise. And that's uh, on our list of discussion items, yes. I encourage you to consider them. So. Thank you. Thank you. Any other qu questions or comments from the public on session one here? Mayor, uh, oh, was there anyone else? I, there were a few uh, typed into the chat that I want to acknowledge during the, this session, if that's okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. We have, um, oh, that was marijuana. It's marijuana. Okay, um, Mrs. Darmo has asking if there's an emergency plan in place if a lot of time goes by without a pickup. And again, encourages everyone to uh, recycle, reduce, and um, that the town should be also uh, giving warnings and ticketing those that do not comply with the, um, uh, you know, weight weight requirements of, of the containers and um, bundles. Uh, and then from Jim P, who's been logged in, and are we considering purchasing a truck 
with automated arms. So just those two asking if um, we have an emergency plan and the second one, are we considering purchasing a truck? Uh, second question first, uh, no plans right now to purchase a truck. A truck would probably be, well, I don't know, I'm not gonna hazard a guess. Uh, regarding the first question, um, uh, what was that? A sneeze. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I lost my place here. It was a, do we have a oh, emergency plan. regarding trash? Um, not, not as yet, uh, but uh, as, uh, as we go forward and tomorrow and the next day, if uh, a contingency plan will certainly be considered, but it will be uh, certainly difficult. Uh, our best, uh, Initial action is to try to get the word out to reduce uh, reduce the bulk and uh, conserve our space on what trucks do what do what trucks do come to town. So, uh, but certainly between us and uh, we lines of communication with our uh, neighboring towns, we're talking with them. And if there's a, a contingency plan that uh, we can arrange for. Uh, something that either we can do ourselves or amongst the three of us or with a third, another contractor, uh, that's certainly, a, it's all on the table. So uh, we've been very adaptable for the last uh, 15, 18 months and we can do it again. So anyway, if there are no further qu comments or questions, this uh, sec first section of public meeting is closed to the public comments and reports. Professionals, uh, Mr. Fox, I know you've been patiently waiting there. No problem, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll try and be brief. Um, the uh, 2020 road program uh, that all that work is complete, uh, except for some punch list work that's still remaining. The 2021 road program that was on the agenda tonight uh, for awarding the contract. Um, we, we added the public works and field of dreams, as, as you know, um, and the third street intersection um, starting Walnut. Um, by doing that, we, uh, I think we saved some money. Our, our original estimate was 536,000 and the bid came in at uh, 491. So, so the bids came in pretty favorable considering, especially considering with the gas prices they are today. Um, the other thing I have is the uh, Newton's Landing outfall structure. Uh, I think uh, most of you are aware of that. Uh, the, it, it's, it, the structure is the responsibility of the township. Um, it's, it's taking Newton's Landing drainage uh, into the, to the creek. Uh, we uh, were looking at doing an emergency repair for that. And it, it's rated adjacent to the uh, Greenway Trail. So time is of the essence and, and it is getting uh, pretty bad and, and in, in danger of collapsing. Um, so we received three quotes. Um, the, the low quote was 31,400. Um, the next quote was 32,850. And actually Pearson, who was doing the Greenway Trail out there, uh, quoted 80,000. Um, I just don't think they wanted to be involved with it. Uh, it took me a while to get a quote and, and it was extremely high. Uh, so I, I would recommend to, to uh, have uh, the low quote is, is store construction was done work in town um, and their quote is 31,400 uh, as an emergency repair. Uh, the other, the, the last thing I have is uh, the DCA recreation grant uh, that you approved the, uh, the, um, um, the application tonight uh, that for 192,400 and they, they were supposed to actually award these on June 11th, um, but I spoke with them today and they received so many applications that they don't even know when they're going to be able to get to announcing awards, but as soon as they do, they will let us know. And that's all I have. Yeah, if, if I may, uh, to follow up on Perry, as long as you're here to uh, have you do a motion authorizing the award to Thor construction for 31 4 for the Newton's Landing outfall so we can get them started on it right away. I have some emergency paperwork to fill out. Harry has to send some stuff to DEP, but we need to get that going. So if 
you're willing to uh, authorize that. I'd appreciate someone making a motion and you don't need a roll call vote, just I and I and A. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's all I have, Mayor. All right, thank you. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, Mr. Einold. Uh, just real quick, Mayor, I wanted to give an update that the um, in-rem foreclosure that we were doing on Burlington Avenue next to River's Edge uh, actually came back uh, faster than normal, possibly because the private sector is not able to do foreclosures uh, or has been delayed. But uh, that's good news for us. So we have to proceed with filing it. However, I just wanted to give you a heads up that we have ownership essentially of that property now. We'll get the uh, document filed with the clerk's office in the county and in your upcoming agenda, uh, next meeting that I'm attending, I will have an ordinance to address the disposition of that property. Uh, if you recall, we want to grant an easement to a property owner to allow them to run a line uh, to service their property and then transfer it to River's Edge, which was the uh, initial intention for the HOA to hold that piece of property. We'll retain right. some rights uh, for public interest, but uh, that will sort of close the loop on that property. And that's all I have, Mayor. All right. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, that was a surprise all the way around. Uh, Township Administrator, Mr. Schwab, welcome back. Thank you. Um, uh oh, you nope. froze up. Freeze up. And the point five, and the point five one was somebody who was drawn down because of them. So that that worked out extremely well. Uh, the chief's going to report on a couple other things that that uh, we've been working on, and uh, that's all I have for now. We we'll discuss good. things in exec. Richard, I didn't catch what you said at the beginning. I'm sorry, you kind of. We we had bids for the bond anticipation of 0.5 percent from the mail, which Paul Florenzo was discussing, and the other bid was 0.51. I think the next one was 1.29. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you briefly froze up there on audio. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Camden County is not doing so well here. Uh, Chief DeSanto. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll make it quick so we don't lose people. Uh, what the, Mr. Schraub was referring to is the alterations to the police department's detention and process areas. We're finally uh, making some headway. Uh, received uh, confirmation from New Jersey DOC today that the uh, plans and scope of work is satisfactory. Um, as I reported before, giving that they we're on the understanding that the Sally Port, which, which you know, common plain terms is a garage, um, you know, should be addressed, and in the future, and our exemptions will you know run year to year on those applications that we make for the for the Sally Port. But in reference to the interior work uh, for the holding cell and the processing area, um, we are able to proceed. And so the bid package went out by Ms. Lord today, and it should be public by June 16th. The next date to follow would be a pre-bid conference on June 29th, and then the bid opening will be on July 20th. And we anticipate to have a recommendation for a, board, a bid award uh, for the August meeting for the Township Committee. And uh, so we look forward and then hopefully we can start it in the fall and move this project forward. Uh, like Mr. Schwab said, this is money that was planned a year ago and it does take time to get these projects moving and, and get through the red tape. Uh, the Franklin Street pedestrian light, as you know, I know uh, the mayor knows it's running. And so the residents, they hear it and uh, yes. operational and functional and um, and you know, like I said, it, it's it's a good thing in terms of its operation. It's uh, very visible and it catches your attention when you're driving. Um, so I think it's a good step forward. And if we can just figure out the little glitch about the uh, audio part, you know, we'll be fine. And 
I think it looks good as well. I think it looks good and it's very practical. I happened to catch the uh, the county folks out there this afternoon. Uh, there were two reps from the private contractor and uh, two uh, county engineers. Um, and what it is, it's a, it's a beep every three seconds. It operates 24 seven. It's, it's an audible beacon. It's, uh, it's a new, uh, because the sign is new, it uh, meets new ADA requirements. Um, you cannot turn it off, but they can turn it down. And it was on full volume as it was installed. They turned it down to 50% uh, of its uh, uh, capability. Uh, I asked them to turn it down to 25%. And they said, well, let's, let's see what this does. Um, so uh, uh, their advice was monitor it. And if there are complaints, let them know and they'll turn it down further, but it cannot be turned off. It's, uh, it's an ADA requirement. And because it's a new sign, a new uh, system, um, uh, you can't disable it. So that's the, that's the background well, it was, that. It's pretty annoying. I was out at the park for three hours yesterday and every time, it seemed like every time a car would go by or if you were driving by, it went off. I didn't know it was every three seconds because I went around that block probably six times myself going back and forth to the park, carting different stuff. And, uh, and of course, Lou's Deli, when I went in there the other day, he yeah. had mentioned it to me. So I did send a lot, uh, an email out to Joe and, and Marty. And of course, Marty's not with the county anymore, but they took care of it right away because I just sent that email out this morning. Yeah, I, I got uh, sent it to Mr. Brickley uh, Sunday morning. And uh, he got back to me about two hours later on Sunday and said they would look into it. Uh, one feature of the device is it, it adjusts the volume depend on the ambient, depending on the ambient noise. So if there's a lot of car traffic, it, it raises the volume because it wants the audible beacon to be detectable by a person who's, uh, who's blind or has a, a vision impairment. So after it quiets down and hopefully at night, um, that volume will go down to the uh, the preset level. So that's probably more information than we need, all need to know, but that's how it works. Well, when the bridge is open and then the, it, they close, you could have as many as 30 cars coming by each way. I mean, that's how it was Sunday when I was there. It was horrendous. So anyway, uh, uh, but please, uh, if, if there... I expect there will be complaints about the current level. Uh, let's let's uh, note that and keep a record of it. And uh, the county said they'll come out tomorrow and uh, and adjust it down further. So let's uh, uh, keep on that. That this is something that uh, we do have a little bit of control on. All right. Uh, anything else, Chief? Yeah, just two more things, real quickly, and I'll move on. Uh, just to give you an update. What's going on with the you know, the parking, no parking signs for Enterprise Drive and Coopertown Road. The the signs, half of them are in, the other half are due to come in June 21st. Mr. Fenimore has contracted uh, county, I guess, public highway or county public works to install the signs because there's going to be a total of 38 between the two sections of roadway. And they have a pneumatic driver uh, to make the work a lot easier. And um, so we're hopefully... Um, as soon as they come in, they're gonna, he's going to reach out to the county, schedule a date, and um, we'll have the signs up. And um, you know, the police will continue to, to do their best, enforcing the statute to state statute reference to parking too close to the intersection, and continue to work with misfits. Um, they had two bad days last week. I went over and talked to the operations manager, and I can say there was a significant improvement on day three after I spoke with them. So what he told me he was going to do, he must have did something or where he just lucked out. The, um, the other item I just wanted to mention that you guys, I was going to speak before the resolutions, but you already took care of it. But there's uh, 416 reached out to us, Ash Street, asked for the removal of the uh, handicapped parking. And uh, I truly appreciate when residents do that. It's very difficult to monitor these handicapped parkings when they're no longer needed. So it's much appreciated when they take the initiative and reach out to us and let us know so we can, you know, remove that. And as you know, parking is a premium in this town. Uh, it's one thing I've learned, if anything. And so anytime we have an opportunity to gain parking for the full public, it, it's a good thing. So that, that was very uh, responsible of them to reach out to us. So that, that's all I have. 
Jesse, you're going to tell them about the uh, change in the application for the uh, body cameras, the, the new yes. equipment, the cameras. Yes. Um, so they aren't surprised when it's on the next agenda. Okay. Uh, the well, the the effect wouldn't be if I'm successful in this request change. It wouldn't come to fruition until um, 20, 2022. Uh, what I've learned is uh, the new directive that was issued by the attorney general in reference to the body camera usage. Uh, we're already prepared for the get camera body camera deployment because we're already deployed and we're in a process of gaining additional cameras every year so we can uh, increase our inventory and have them available for every officer and some spare ones. Um, what I've learned is this new directive is calling for some um, requirements on the management part, or I would say back end in terms of storage and also in terms of tracking, which I don't believe our system is uh, best equipped for. And I understand the manufacturer that we use has come out with a new upgraded system. So I reached out to the, uh, the office, the attorney general, a reference to the body camera uh, grant. I informed them of my, you know, my uh, finding this information out and, the, and I put it on myself that I failed to, to realize that the life of these, lifespan of these current cameras we have is reaching their end. And um, so I asked them if it'd be possible to change my application to include for a new system, meaning that we would get 13 new cameras along with the new system. And um, I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds, but it's not as a big of a price sticker as you're gonna think it's gonna be. They said they would consider uh, not my, consider my change of application from six cameras to 13 cameras, which we're getting, we would get $2,000 per camera, that's 26,000. And the, uh, um, I didn't get a quote yet, but we're talking area to get a new system to meet the requirements of this directive in the area about 46,000. We already pay about $8,000 in warranties, um, software costs every year. So in lieu of that in 2022, if we get the grant for 26, we defer that $8,000 we're paying for warranties, software, um, maintenance, we can add that. And like I said, it's not gonna be a huge uh, spike to get a whole new system or brand new cameras, which are guaranteed uh, for five years uh, to replace, no, no questions asked. So I'm meeting with the rep on Wednesday of this manufacturer to confirm all this. I put the uh, feelers out for the uh, attorney general's office to see if they would consider this, uh, adding the seven additional cameras for a total of 13. So if they are agreeable to this, I'll come back to you with exact numbers in 2022. Um, and that was my second part of the request was that I defer our grant award until 2022. Uh, so the budget can reflect uh, any difference in cost when we start adding up the grant plus the already money that we budget every year for the warranties and for the maintenance and for the software of licensing. So I'd make you aware of that and I'll keep you abreast and hopefully maybe next week I'll have a idea of I'll get a response from the AG's office and also and a number of exactly how much it would cost to go to the upgraded system. Thank you. That's a lot there. Yeah. Appreciate a lot of it. money, a lot of things going on. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Fenimore is uh, unable to attend this evening. Uh, Mrs. Lord, administration. Uh, a couple of things. Um, I know there's a section to talk about COVID later, but um, I wanted to acknowledge the receipt of correspondence from the state with the um, governor uh, signing the rescission of many of the most of the executive orders. Uh, we received correspondence from the Department of um, Community Affairs that um, sus suspends the uh, COVID. OPRA requirements that gave longer response times um, for fulfilling OPRA. We actually were very good with keeping up with our OPRA requests, um, but Doug asked that I acknowledge that receipt from the, the Department of Community Affairs for the um, going back to the regular uh, OPRA timelines. It's much shorter. Um, 
We also received correspondence from the state, uh, New Jersey State Registrar's Office uh, going back to the um, normal uh, process for taking marriage license application. During COVID, uh, the 72 hour waiting period was waived as well as we were allowed to take uh, applications um, through Zoom or other virtual means. And that is also uh, going away with these executive orders. We will go back to the in-person um, and there will be no uh, waiver. They'll go back to 72 hour waiting period. So those two things are acknowledged for the, um, for the record. Um, also too, I have some correspondence, but that'll be later. Um, we have another member of the administrative staff who has uh, successfully completed the technical assistant to the construction official courses and successfully um, uh, passed the test. So we have uh, Jessica Husband, who is now a certified technical assistant to the construction official. And it's really very, very nice to have two people who are trained, certified, because we're very busy in the construction department. And the rest I'll have either during correspondence or during the COVID discussion. All right, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Martin, uh, anything from planning board? No, no applications. At this point. Um, Mrs. Martin, your I, voice got really deep there. I know. <laughs> Sorry, Kitty. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, right now, I have received no new applications for the next meeting. So uh, it more than likely will be canceled, but we don't like to jump the gun and do that too soon. So we'll be making a decision shortly on that. All right, okay, very good, thank you. Um, looks like the next item's a, a back for public comment. You see the same thing? You can open the meeting to the public for session two. All right. Uh, meeting open to the public for comments, questions, session two. And uh, again, once again, name, address. Uh, Matt Bartlett, uh, 1800 second. Real quick, any status update on the removal of that dilapidated structure at 507 Burlington? Uh, I know last month we heard from Mr. Stepinski that it would be any week now. Anything new? I just forwarded an email to uh, Richard and Mike and Janice that uh, Mr. Stepinski said to me that public service just finally capped it off. That's what they've been waiting for apparently. So uh, I'm sure they'll reach out to Jesse soon. Cross my fingers, thank you. Yep. All right, uh, comment question section of the meeting is now closed to the public. Uh, status of coronavirus disease and executive orders. Uh, Mrs. Laurie, you covered some of that. Um, status of township committee meetings. Uh, as we go forward, if uh, the emergency, COVID emergency is rescinded, uh, that force basically forces us back into the room, correct? Without. Uh, no, I, I asked Doug uh, to um, about that question. Does the rescission of the executive, of these executive orders say we can no longer meet? via Zoom and I'll let Doug take it from here. So I'm uh, part of an attorney's group and this has been a hot discussion. The, uh, the group is somewhat split on the legal opinion on the legality of these meetings. My view, and I think, well, it's my view, so I think it's the better view, is that um, <laughs> we could have done this without any intervention uh, from the legislature uh, and that work fully complying with the Open Public Meetings Act by holding remote meetings. Um, we can return to uh, regular sessions. When I say regular sessions, return to in-person meetings. Um, I do, uh, so, so that's sort of the front end legal issue, but I wanna just add some operational concerns there's also been some discussion about hybrid meetings. Um, I personally think it's something that can be achieved, but one of the areas that is most uh, ripe for potential concern 
is not our area, but the, but the land use proceeding area because they're acting in a quasi judicial manner, hearing applications, taking evidence, rendering decisions. And on 90 plus percent of applications, whether we're, I think it's been very effective uh, with remote meetings. I think it's obviously been historically effective in person. Um, the problems or the pitfalls seem to arise sometimes with split uh, split meetings. So um, just something for the governing body to sort of think about as we move back into this, if we're, if we're talking about moving back to regular meetings, period, in person, um, I think that's, that's one thing. If we're talking about doing something in a modified format where we're going back in person, but also allowing a, a Zoom overlay with added technology, I think it's worth discussing, but it's a discussion that should probably bring in Lou Gardy and the, and the board officials who need to deal with it at the board level. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Lohr, reopening of the municipal building to full-time? Yes, the plan right now is uh, June 21st, Monday, June 21st, we will return to a uh, full-time operations, except for the Monday evening. That's still, um, we don't want to go there yet with the evening hours, but the um, Monday, through, uh, Monday through Thursday, 9, 9 well, right now, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then Friday the half day. Right now we're closed on Friday, Wednesdays and Fridays, but we are going to reopen. Um, the staff, the administrative staff will be all returning. We've been on hybrid schedules, uh, modified schedules um, to maintain social distancing. But I think the one thing um, that committee, so that will, that's all planned for June 21st. Um, and I, what should be on here is number five um, would be our Delanco policy update. Uh, with people returning, uh, working closer together without the uh, social distancing as much as we've had would be the, um, right now our policy from, for masks is um, if you're inside the municipal building, you wear a mask um, in every part of the municipal building, vaccinated or not vaccinated. So that is the policy as it is right now. So I believe, uh, Fern, you're our liaison in the um, COVID response team. As we go forward uh, in, on the uh, administrative side, uh, to have the employees not wear masks as long as they've been vaccinated. Uh, but then if you haven't been vaccinated, then it should still be required to wear a mask. Uh, my understanding as far as uh, the CDC uh, guidelines. Uh, as far as residents coming in or the public coming into the building, uh, that seems to be hit or miss depending on what facility you go to. Yeah. yeah. That's what makes this difficult is that there's no set standard for um, indoor mask policy, uh, vaccinated, unvaccinated. Some facilities, you go, you're gonna go in, they don't care if you're vaccinated, you're putting a mask on and some masks optional for everybody. So it's, it's not easy to deal with right now. And there's a lot of misconceptions, um, what the public has, they just, they feel that you don't have to wear a mask anymore, anywhere. So, um, but right now, the written policy is uh, everyone must, must wear a mask inside the municipal building. And so I'm asking if the committee wants to uh, amend that policy or continue with that policy. Uh, well, the, the safe, easy thing is to continue. Uh, the other good thing is we've got the side uh, comp you know, meeting room that uh, has the new window and so forth. So that affords uh, a degree of separation and protection, which uh, is glad we got that installed so quickly, relatively. Um, hold what we got, what uh, maintain the policy as we have for next week and during this week, uh, sort it out and uh, see if you want to, if we want to move to uh, uh, 
a lightening of the standards for uh, next Monday. I can put it on the agenda. All right. Continued discussion. Do you have anything from the other municipalities that you're dealing with or anything that you may have come across? Yeah, it's probably about as varied as you're seeing in the commercial context. Um, one thing I will note is I, I think where I have seen uh, signage up still, what I think is the most legally correct signage is signs that say, if you're not vaccinated, you're, you're encouraged or even strongly encouraged to continue to wear a mask. The CDC guidelines do not mandate it. Um, so I think it, it allows, the state has allowed us to, uh, or any entity to put in stricter uh, guidelines, but I think that is the one that's the most consistent with the current CDC provisions. Uh, so just something to think about if the town is considering opening up the municipal building further. And, and the only other element to that that I think is beneficial is I think it's very difficult or unfair for the municipal employees who have to have these interactions to effectively become monitors on top of their original job. And that can sometimes lead to unpleasant conversations, um, misinterpreted uh, questions, things of that nature. So I just think we set the policy and hope for the best. And um, I, so it's all worth discussion, but I think if we're gonna do something to move to a, a more open status, then I think once we say you can come in without a mask on, the sign should be a guidance, not a, a mandate and the employee shouldn't have to police or ask questions about it. Agreed, agreed. Uh, anything in the executive orders update that hasn't been covered in this discussion? No, I think we've touched upon everything. There's nothing more that I would think is uh, necessary to bring up. All right, very good. Uh, correspondence? Uh, yes. We received a letter from um, the New Jersey Department of Transportation um, announcing that applications are being accepted for the 2022 Safe Routes to School program. And they are, those applications are due on or before October 14th, 2021. So I'm not sure if the committee wants to participate or file, um, you know, a application under the safe routes to school. Maybe Harry can talk more about that. And we received correspondence. Excuse me, bear with me. Also from the New Jersey Department of Transportation regarding maintenance roadway contract S-117. And they are currently preparing construction con contract documents for this project in the scope of the, um, and it's maintenance, it's highway maintenance. So the map shows from about Cinnamonson down through Edgewater Park on Route 130, they're going to be doing highway maintenance. Not this is not the reconstruction or the redoing of the jug handle, the Bridgeboro um, Route 130 jug handle. This is normal uh, highway maintenance, how much is involved, I, I don't know, but whenever the highway goes under uh, work, it, it can create even worse high um, traffic nightmares. And maybe Harry, you can also speak more about that. And those are the two pieces of correspondence that I have. Uh, Harry, you got anything to add on that uh, that recreation? Safe, yes. safe routes. Safe route. yeah, safe safe routes to school. Uh, yep, safe routes to school. Um, we, we've applied for this uh, several times. Um, we we even had uh, CPG and H um, through the Bridge Commission apply for it. Uh, we, we we've never received anything in in Delanco for that. Um, it's not due to October, so we have time to think right. about it, but. It, it's it, it's a it's it's a pretty difficult grant to receive. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, that completes the agenda. Essentially, executive session. We've got a couple items to take care of uh, or talk about, and I need a resolution 
for executive session. I suspect uh, maybe 30 to 45 minutes, hopefully 20 minutes or less. And uh, yeah. Okay, it'll be resolution 2021-81, resolution to go into executive se session for um, attorney client, contract negotiations. Was there anything else? I think that was about it. That's about it. Motion, please. So move. Second. We're all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, for the record, the Township Committee has um, returned to public session from the executive session. You guys are um, all set to continue. Okay. Mayor, do you ha is there any business that the Township Committee needs to act on at I this time? I believe we need to act on any business and I think uh, a motion to adjourn. I'll motion to adjourn. I'll second. I'll second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Hey, hey you're muted. Hey, everybody. She's saying something. She's muted. Hi, <laughs> yes. I wanted it on the public record that we were going to appoint a committee, uh, a subcommittee for the cannabis at the next meeting. I wanted that on the public record. Slip that on prior to the adjournment, huh? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Slip that in. All in favor for adjournment. There was a motion, but Kate got her comment in for the well record. Done. It's on the recording as well, Kate, so. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Good night. You're welcome. Good night. The recording has stopped.